two and one. Is it all going? Yeah. Pretty good. Sorry about that. Um, we've got some new tech. I'll explain that in a second for you. Um, so as I say, yeah, phones, if you could please, um, at the very least, turn them silent. I don't mind people using them as long as it doesn't disturb the flow of the meeting. Um, we're not expecting a fire alarm. Um, if one does go off, please, if you would follow us to the uh, car park over the road next to the windmill pub. Uh, we will need to make sure that we check all your names off before you leave, just to make sure you're out of the building safely uh, before we send you on your merry little way. Um, the meeting itself is a meeting in public. It is not a public meeting, so only the people that have been registered to speak will be permitted to do so. Uh, at the appropriate time, I will call you forward. I'll give you allotted uh, time uh, for, for your speech. Um, and if you sit at any one of the three desks in front of us, uh, you, can, you can deliver it from there. We do have new microphones. You don't need to press any buttons to get them started. Um, we, as soon as you start speaking, the volume will be turned up and you'll be heard. It's close. The closer you can get to the microphone, the better, because obviously it picks it up better. Typically about a hand's width should do the job. Um, but as I say, if you sit in front of one of these, uh, as soon as you start speaking, it will pick you up. Let's get into um, some introductions, if I may. So to my far right, we have uh, Kira Keller, who is our committee services representative. To my immediate right, we have Amy Shipley, who is our solicitor. And our planners, who are sat over here in no particular order, are Louise Coleman, Victoria Kempton, Stuart McIver, and Lanaka Agnew. And to my immediate left is Emily Napier, who is our planning manager. Emily, could you? I believe you've got a statement to make. I do. Thank you, Chair. My role tonight is to provide impartial advice to committee members and to assist members in their decision taking. Fabulous. <coughs> Fabulous. Thank you very much indeed. Let's get into the meeting itself. Um, so first of all, apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies, please? We do. We have apologies from Councillor Hensher Seraphin. Marvellous. Thank you very much. And disclosures of interest members. I'm going to kick us off, if I may. So um, first of all, uh, we have application reference 22023180 FUL. That's Toad Hall, the Green in Snitfield. Um, I'm the ward member and I have registered to speak, so I will be removing myself from the table, at which point Councillor Kendall will be taking the chair on my behalf. Um, on the first item we're hearing tonight, which will be application reference 2102017 FUL at land at Crimscote in Wimpston, um, I have received three separate emails, one from the applicant, one from uh, Stephen Norrie of Stratford Climate um, uh, Group, and an, another one, and I can't, if I'm honest, with you, I can't remember who it was, CPRE it was. Um, I'm going to assume that everyone else has received the same. I'm seeing a lot of nodding, so we'll do that as a blanket one. Anyone else have any disclosures they'd like to make? Councillor Harvey. Yes, um, <clears throat> in relation to item four, the application of land at Crimscott, um, my position is well known because I have uh, submitted uh, my comments 15 months ago. So I shall be leading the table while that is discussed. Similarly, uh, item six, Treading Hill Barnes, I'm the ward member. I will speak, I'm registered to speak. I'll leave the table for that meeting, for that item as well. Lovely, thank you very much. Councillor Rock, please. Um, I'm the ward member for item uh, four. Um, I think that's right. No, item seven, sorry. Uh, and I'll be leaving the cable table to speak and will not participate in the decision otherwise. Understood. Thank you. And Councillor Curtis. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, 2102017. I live in Alderminster. I'm a member of Alderminster Parish Council, but I wasn't a member of the Parish Council when they submitted their no objection originally. So I approach this with an open mind. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Anyone else? No? Marvellous. Okay, um, next item is minutes. Everyone happy with the minutes as presented in the agenda pack? Quick thumbs up. Yeah, lovely. I will sign those after the meeting. Okay, let's get into our first uh, real item uh, of the evening, which is application reference 2102017 FUL, land at Krimska in Wimston. Our presenting officer is Louise Coleman. Louise, over to you. Thank you, Chair. 
The site is located approximately 660 metres northwest of Crimskit and 2.8 kilometres north of Ilmington. The site, which is demarked by, with the red line, is approximately 59.4 hectares of agricultural land made up of six fields. The site is situated between Redhill Bank Road and Crimskit Road. The site abuts Wimston Fields Farm Complex, which comprises of industrial storage sheds and poultry buildings, together with a small cluster of residential properties along part of its northwestern boundary. Dwellings known as Lees Farm and Willow Lawn, previously known as Tranquil, lie to the west. A public right of way identified by the green hatch line terminates close to the western boundary of the site. Further public footpaths are located to the south and southwest, and the Monarch Way Centenary Way footpath is located approximately 2.9 kilometres to the west of the site. There are no statutory designations on the site, however, it lies approximately 2.3 kilometres east of the Cotswolds area of outstanding natural beauty and one kilometre west of Felden Special Landscape Area. There are no listed buildings within the site and the site lay, lies within Flood Zone 1. The proposal seeks to construct a solar farm with supporting equipment, including battery storage containers, a 15 metre high telecoms mast, access tracks, inverter cabins, sorry, inverter units, a customer cabin, underground cables and grid connection substation. The application is for a temporary 40 year period with the exception of a substation which has been applied for on a permanent basis. The anticipated capacity of the solar farm is 49.9 megawatts and underground cables would connect the development to the grid via an existing overhead line approximately 200 metres to the east of the site entrance. The panels themselves have a maximum height of 3 metres and are mounted between 0.6 and 1.2 metres on off the ground. Mm. Perimeter fencing um, around the site would be 2 metres in height. CCTV cameras would be mounted on poles uh, measuring 3.5 metres and telecoms mast would have a maximum height of 15 metres and finally associated building structures and plant a maximum of 5.9. The arrangement of the panels is shown on the layout plan with the substation and telecoms mast being located uh, close to the industrial storage sheds and poultry buildings at Wimstone Fields Farm in this area here. This is an elevation of the mast, telecoms mast, which as I say, is, well, has a maximum height of 15 meters. This is the uh, landscaping uh, proposals. Existing hedgerow and tree planting around the boundaries of the site are proposed to be retained and supplemented in areas, especially along the southern boundary. In addition, there would be planting in the land edged in blue, um, which abuts Crimskirt Road with, there are patches with no planting in there, that's, which would be um, planted up with new hedgerows. New woodland areas are proposed along the southwestern, northern and northeastern boundaries, together with new hedgerow planting, new wildflower and grass mix areas um, within the site itself and also along the northern boundary. Access is proposed to be off uh, um, a new point off Red Hill Bank Road with a new priority junction with visibilities uh, with a setback of 2.4 metres and forward visibility in 215 in both directions. Turning now to photographs of the site, um, this is a view taken from Red Hill Bank Road looking at uh, Lee's farm. So the um, black line identifies the extent of the um, application, sorry, the red the red line identifies the area of development and the black line identifies where the panels, uh, approximate location of the panels would go in all of these photographs. This is a, a view just panning around slightly, so where the proposed uh, access point would be and then the access road and then the start of the panels themselves. 
And I'm going to show you a series of um, photographs which do include photo montages that have been provided um, by the applicants. So this is a view you can see from here taken from Crimskirt Downs, which is a public footpath south of the site. So this is looking at the existing area. This is a photo montage showing as as proposed. And then this is indicative um, of uh, after 15 years with proposed planting. But obviously, members need to be bearing in mind this is indicative in all of these views. And turning now to photo montage three. So this is looking at a view from Crimscote Road. So with existing year one and then indicatively after 15 years. This is a view from Monarchs Way and Centenary Way to the east, sorry, apologies, to the west of the site, looking down at the application area. So Lee's Farm is identified here with Winston Fields Farm at the back. So that's existing. And then we go into photo montage of year one and then photo montage of year 15 with um, indicative planting. Finally, this is a view from the public right of way, the west of Ilmington. Again, the view here. So this is as existing. This is proposed year one. And then indicatively with the planting after 15 years. There are two updates for members to note. And the recommendation is to grant planning permission subject to the conditions and notes as detailed in the report. Thank you, Chair. Louise, thank you very much indeed. Let's call our first speaker of the evening, who is Dr. David Buckley of Whitchurch Parish Meeting. Good evening. So, Dr. Buckley, you'll have three minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning before your time is up. If you could stay seated for questions afterwards, I'd be grateful. Otherwise, as soon as you're sat comfortable and ready to go, the floor is yours. OK. Go. Speaking on behalf of Whitchurch Parish, I should like to emphasise that we are supportive of green energy. I myself have installed solar panels, a battery storage system and drive a full electric car. But we are also aware of the downsides. And although this application is a good idea, it is in the wrong place and the benefits do not outweigh the harm done. Our crisis presently is twofold, energy security and food security. This plan trades one for the other. When this choice is not necessary, there are suitable alternatives. Core strategy policy CS3 on sustainable energy, and in particular solar energy, states the need to, one, consider the impact on agricultural activities. The farm currently produces important arable crops of wheat and oil rapeseed. Two, the need to consider the impact on the openness and character of the landscape and on the vigil amenity. Focusing on this, the Warwickshire Landscape Guidelines state that the landscapes within the Feldon Vale farmlands are of medium to high sensitivity to solar developments over 25 hectares. This site is significantly larger at 59.5 hectares. The planning officer acknowledges that the proposed development would introduce a substantial new character change. And the landscape officer also considered that this is likely to have a significant effect on the landscape character. In particular, the open boundary referred to in the report along the C141 Crimscot Road, which has open views across the land, is intensively used for recreation by walkers, cyclists, runners and horse riders. And the site impact will be severely detrimental to the character and appearance of this area. Contrary to policy CS1, CS5 of the adopted core strategy and AS10 of the draft core strategy. This site, the size of 111 football pitches with panels up to three metres high, surrounded by 2.5 metre security fencing, 3.5 metre poles with cameras on top, this will look like an MOD site. The applicant promises mitigation, which sits outside of the plan. We were promised similar planting at other sites, and these have failed to be delivered, and the planning officer are unlikely to enforce this due to lack of manpower and expense. I therefore urge the committee to visit the site and also to Ilmington hill, an area of outstanding natural beauty, to see the visual impact and potential glint and glare created as it lies directly south of the development and as such is likely to be far more impactful than that at Blackwell, in addition to being six times larger. 
30 seconds. If you do decide to grant this application, I urge you to seek section 106 expenses for the repair of the road from C48 in Wimpstone to C71 in Darlingscote. These roads were inev will inevitably suffer considerable damage, as was the case when Clifford Chambers was closed for only four weeks, as this development entails six months of an additional 22,500 HGV journeys, the damage for which the taxpayer will otherwise be responsible for. Thank you. Dr Buckley, thank you very much. Spot on three minutes. Thank you for that. Um, members, have we got any questions? Councillor Parry first, please. Good evening, Dr Buckley. I just wonder... <laughs> Don't worry. Um, I just wonder whether you can advise uh, this committee the extent of the consultation um, from the applicant and how the applicant has engaged with the local community. I haven't seen them once. And I don't think they put they put on a meeting, but I think that a lot of it was uh, uh, a waste of time. It was we'll promise you this, we'll promise you that. There's no promises of anything, and worries us about the the commitments that they say that they've put in this because nobody's going to enforce them. So there's, they, they've given no indication of any particular there is no, community benefit. There's no benefit to the community at all. Councillor Mills, next, please. Councillor Parry has uh, also the same question. No problem. Councillor Crump, please. Um, you mentioned trading uh, food security for uh, energy security. I've tried to look through the, the report, but I couldn't see what was actually on the land that's uh, being farmed at the moment. Could you tell me what it is, please? Well, it's been graded um, as 3B, but I expect that there are areas that are clearly 3A of high quality because they have grown rapeseed oil in the past, and we've seen that. It's grown wheat and various crops. I don't know what they're growing on it at the moment because it's all barren. Um, they also um, do have sheep on there on occasions. So there's a mixture of farming going on on it. Um, but they certainly have grown crops. And as we've seen, this is very important because we import 80% of our food. And this is disgraceful because that what it's all very well for us all to um, think that we're doing the right thing. But this is contributing to CO2 and is going to rise if we get rid of arable hey, land. We, we, we're somewhat Sorry. straying away from the question there. Sorry. I'll let you go a little Before bit. Let's just hit. make sure we stick to the questions because we've got a lot to get yeah, through. Yeah, so they, they do, they do um, it's arable land. But what they've grown this year, we'll, I don't know. We'll perhaps ask that of the agent and the applicant later on. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Curtis, next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr Buckley, you mentioned some, I believe, some other sites in reference to um, mitigation planting that hadn't taken place. Armskirt and Blackwell. Now, um, can, can you just clarify, are these by the same developer? No. Thank you. Any other questions, members? No? Dr Buckley, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Thank you. OK, we'll call forward our next speaker of the evening, who is Mr Richard Gotch from Crimscote Community, on behalf of Crimscote Community, I should say. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much for your patience. Um, once again, you will have three minutes. I will give you a 30 second warning before your time is up. But otherwise, whenever you're sat comfortable and ready to go, the floor is Thank yours. You. Thank you very much. The president of the National Farmers Union recently stated that the UK has no food security strategy. At the time, food was relatively cheap, the result of 80% being imported. But challenges with supply mean that food is no longer cheap. North Cotswold Food Bank says the number of emergency parcels handed out from April to September has more than doubled. Importing 80% of our food also has a severe impact on our environment. 26% is brought to us by hundreds of diesel trucks every day. The majority of the rest reaches us by ship, a mode of transport that is one of the world's worst polluters. This is not a small solar farm with minimum impact. At 147 acres, it is more than twice the maximum size recommended in the Warwickshire Landscape Guidelines. That also makes it very hard to hide. The landscape officer has stated that it will have a significant effect on landscape character. As one local resident told me, from a popular beauty spot in the Cotswold Hills, you can see this site and two other solar sites without moving your head. 
I mention this to show that siting a new solar power station is a complex decision. We are asking you to understand that responding to the climate emergency does not excuse us from the responsibility to consider the wider implications of our decisions. With this in mind, the government's draft policy statement for renewable energy infrastructure states that where possible, ground-mounted solar projects should avoid the use of agricultural land classified as best and most versatile. The exclusion of Grade 3B land from this classification is very much up for debate. In June this year, the DEFRA Secretary of State emphasised that it does include 3B and above. However, responding to pressure from lobby groups, he backed down. But it shows how marginal this division is. It's particularly marginal at this site, where the land quality grades from 3A to 3B. Just last week, the new government concerned that much needed work on revising the current guidance continues. Our country needs a joined up strategy that improves food security while ensuring food is affordable, which protects our countryside as a treasured amenity for us and for our children, and which also enables the undoubted benefits of solar energy. But these vast solar power stations must be in responsible locations, such as factory roofs, car park canopies, and integral with new housing developments, as they are in many other countries. 30 seconds. The transition from short-sighted, profit-driven development to solar as a joined up strategy doesn't have to start with national government. It can start here with local government by deciding on a planned green future instead of the ad hoc profit driven future that is being presented today. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Minister Gotch, thank you very much indeed. Members, do we have any questions for our speaker, please? Councillor Dixon, first of all. Much mentioned, I think, that, uh, that from a certain beauty spot viewpoint, various solar farms could already be seen. Can you tell me where that viewpoint was, please? Yes, this is the bench on Foxcote Hill. Foxcote Hill, thank you. OK, any other questions for our speaker? No? In that case, Mr Gotch, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Thank you very much. OK, we'll call forward our final speakers on this application. Uh, we have three of them. So um, we have Sherry Gregory, the agent. We have Stephen Cowper and we have John Stott. If you would like to make your way forward. Uh, sorry, say that again. John Stott has dropped out. OK, do we have a Stephen Cowper with us? Yes. Are you speaking? I've got you registered to speak, so if you want to come forward to sit at one of the... I've got you registered in the same slot. Would you would you mind coming forward? I've got you both registered in this slot. So between you, you've got six minutes. How are you going to split your time? Uh, three minutes. Okay. Three each. So I'll, what we'll do is for three minutes, three minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning before your three minutes up. When three minutes is there, I'll let you know you can start and then we'll do questions for both of you afterwards, if that's all right. Okay. So, um, Ms. Gregory, whenever you're ready, over to you. Good evening, Chair and members of the Planning Committee. In terms of the openness and character of the landscape and visual amenity, the site is not located within or adjacent to a nationally or locally designated landscape. The site is dominated by the industrial style, style shed south of Wimstone Fields Farm. As shown in our studies and in agreement with the council's landscape officers, the visual impact was not found to be significant from surrounding public views. The photo montages submitted with the application demonstrate the limited visibility of the site from various locations and take account of the existing solar farms in the assessment. They found that no single location affords a view of more than one solar farm. Oh. Nevertheless, so I'm going to pause we've you there. I'm going to, I'm going to pause you there. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, all of our, all the speakers that we've had so far have um, been allowed to speak without interruption. I'd be very grateful if you would not moan, groan, shout, or make a noise while our speakers are speaking. I understand you have a view. You've had your opportunity to make that view known please, because we need to listen to what people have to say. Sorry about that. I have stopped your time. I will give you a couple of seconds to get going again, and then I'll start again. Nevertheless, we've included proposals for boundary hedgerows, a 30 meter wide woodland belt and a new orchard, alongside 52 hectares of wildflower planting and 4.75 hectares for farmland birds. These measures would deliver significant biodiversity gain of greater than 50%. 
The 40 year life of the solar farm will allow the soil to rest during which time it accumulates organic matter rather than lose it through crop production. Should the solar farm be built, it will still serve an agricultural function through grazing sheep. Research from Terra Farmer, a consultancy specializing in advising UK farms on sustainable farming, states that traditional solar farms with sheep grazing work to suppress dirt carbon and help rebuild soil health. In terms of transport, on the average day during construction, there would be only nine HDV movements in contract to what the, the councillor is stating. When compared to the average daily traffic flow on the A3400, the traffic generated from the construction of the solar farm reflects less than a 1% increase. The peak month of HGV movements would see 25 HGV movements per day, which is just short of an 18% increase, I'll allow. While noticeable, it's compared with a low baseline flow level of only 142 movements and is for a temporary period. The Warwickshire County Highway does not object to the proposal subject to our compliance with conditions. Warwickshire County Highways does not object to the proposals subject to our compliance with conditions. In terms of community benefit, we've entered into an agreement with Warwickshire Wildlife Trust to fund grassroots environmental projects to benefit residents of Stratford-upon-Avon District Council. The trust will receive just under £15,000 per year every year over the course of the life of the solar farm for a total of £600,000. The trust will seek community input to determine how the, spent, the funds are spent locally. 30 seconds. Separately, discussions have been ongoing since April 2021 for a community energy group to acquire the project once constructed. The benefit of community ownership is that profits of the scheme can only be, can be recycled into localized benefits through a community fund. Our preference has always been for the site to be acquired by a local community energy group. In light of the officer's recommendation to approve and no objections from statutory consultees, I respectfully request you approve this application. Marvellous. Thank you very much. That was just inside your three minutes. <clears throat> the good news for you, Mr Capra, is you get an extra three seconds. <laughs> Use it as wisely. Whenever you're ready, I will start the timer. The floor is yours. We were first approached in 2014 about the possibility of constructing a solar park on some of our land. At this point, we were looking at it purely commercial view, but unfortunately, the company we were dealing with at the time uh, failed to get a grid connection, so this was taken no further. When we were approached again by Regenerate eight years later, our view had changed somewhat. Uh, we were now struggling to control black grass, which is a very invasive weed, due to lack of new chemistry and increasing resistance to existing chemicals. Due to the nature of our heavy clay soils, we are unable to reliably grow spring crops on our land, so this is neither a reliable nor economic method of control of this weed. This, however, was not the main reason for considering again. We now had a government that was no longer supporting agricultural production, but instead had its focus on environmental schemes. But most importantly for us, we now had grandchildren and were becoming increasingly concerned about the future they face with global warming. We have watched many programmes about the risk we're all facing in the future, but what really brought this home was visiting the Rhone Glacier in Switzerland earlier this year and seeing photographic evidence of exactly how far this glacier has retreated in the last 20 years. We all know we need to address this situation to counter the issues we all face. And whilst we could all return to living very simple lives, burning less fossil fuel, this is unlikely to happen. So we need to find ways to generate as much genuinely renewable energy as possible. The argument for food production on our, on our land or any other land is a valuable point. However, we must bear in mind uh, that we currently grow wheat, which goes to Syristar in Manchester, which is then turned into ethanol, which will find its way back into your cars. And the also rate which we grow is a hydroristic variety, which again is crushed, is for use in plastics and personal care products. We must also bear in mind all the other uses of agricultural land that currently take place, such as growing feedstocks for anaerobic digestion, vineyards, which become increasingly common, golf courses, forestry, and of course, the many thousands of acres, which currently stand at close to 900,000 acres, up from 300,000 acres just eight years ago, which are in environmental schemes, which produce very little. The establishment of a solar park on this piece of land, which is relatively isolated, will produce a sound and reliable income which will enable us to continue farming the roaming land and provide a secure future for our children and grandchildren. And when I say our, I mean all of our, not just mine. As I'm sure you're aware, there is a finite amount of energy available from the sun. We can capture this as plant growth, animal growth, wind, solar power, many forms. 
We have the problem there are limited areas to produce all our own needs, so we will always have to import. I personally would rather import grain from Canada than gas from Russia. Thank you to you both. Members, do we have any questions for our speakers, please? Councillor Crump first. Thank you. Oh, I think it's uh, to Mr Cowper. Um, I asked a question to, um, to Dr Buckley about what the line is currently for, and you, I heard you mention it was um, rapeseed oil and we, wheat. Obviously right. um, and obviously you explained where it was going. What type of quality of land is it? Is it 3A, 3B? It's 3B. 3B, thank you. And am I right? Can I just have a slightly amendment? Um, and are you saying this, this is helping the viability of the farm by having this? Absolutely. We are, we're, we're facing, um, I don't know how much time I'm allowed to answer that. We're, we're facing huge problems at the moment, as everybody is, with increasing inputs. The value, the, the cost to us to produce wheat, I have to be fair, I put my hands in the air and say, we had a very good year last year because we bought in at low prices and sold as wheat went up at high prices. It's a completely different story now. Wheat is going down, the price of fuel has risen dramatically, the price of fertiliser has risen dramatically, and the price of your agrochemicals has risen dramatically. I'd be very surprised in 10 years' time at current prices if anyone's actually producing wheat in this country. Can I just have a... One more. And you mentioned something about an invasive weed. Sorry, yeah. You mentioned something about an invasive weed. Uh, black grass, yes. Very invasive weed. Uh, it's been, been, been a problem on heavy ground like ours for lots of years, but in the last 10 it has become a major problem. It is the number one problem in the UK. Um, there are virtually no chemicals which will control it successfully once it's more than that high. And we stack lots of chemicals on the ground to try and control it. Sometimes effective, sometimes not. To the extent where some years we just burn the crop off because that's the only way to control it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Parry, next, please. Good evening, Mr Cowper. Um, I wonder whether you can advise um, where the nearest residential dwelling is that is not connected to either your ownership or your family ownership from the solar farm. I was just trying to... Are we talking about a residential dwelling that can actually see it? A uh, residential dwelling uh, that's actually voiced an opinion? Or uh, just a residential no. dwelling that a you want the closest one? How, how far away is the nearest residential Probably dwelling that is not... Not related to me. That, that is not related to you um, or your family? There are some cottages associated with the... Uh, in, in sort of on the bottom left hand side of your screen, where all the poultry units and other, other industrial units are. There mm -hmm. are some houses there, and cottages, farm workers' cottages there. Okay. And can I just ask another? Um, when I asked Dr. Buckley um, about your consultation or engagement with the local parish council, he seemed to infer that, that there wasn't any or certainly very much. I will pass this back to Cherie, but my understanding is that they have tried very hard. Yeah, so we can't. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so to address your question, Councillor, contact was made with the parish and board councillors to invite them to the webinar that we held as part of our outreach. Uh, there was very little response to that, unfortunately, and we, we could have carried forward that conversation if there were. Okay, Councillor Curtis, next, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, first of all, just picking up on your last comment, um, the webinar, were there any attempts to have live meetings made in local village halls to actually meet residents? At the time, COVID uh, guidance in place prevented us from doing so. You'll understand this application went in June 2021. Yeah. And so our community outreach was done before that in the lead up to the okay. submission of the application. Thank you. I've just, just got three other quick questions, if I may. Um, you heard, obviously, there's a bit of an outcry from, from uh, the gallery when you mentioned that the other solar farms couldn't be seen. Do you know the bench on Foxcut Hill and the view from the bench on Foxcut Hill? I can describe the viewpoints that we included. And so I'm no, just asking if you know I that particular. Thank you. Um, 
You mentioned, I think, and uh, forgive me, you gave a lot of very helpful information. You mentioned, I think, a 1% increase of HGVs on the A3400. What was, what was the percentage of increase on HGVs on the smaller roads through Crimscot, for example, over the Crimscot Bridge, which is quite important? We had to focus on traffic movement on the A3400 because that's where it's being measured, to be fair. So I don't have that data. It's not publicly available or being measured. So you, you don't have data for HGV increases on the very minor rural roads? No, I do not. No. Okay. And just rather more positive, I hope. Um, you mentioned uh, something about the community energy schemes or groups. Could you just uh, give a little more information on that, please? So we're a developer. Uh, we, we tend to bring projects through the planning uh, process. And we have a variety of options. Once we've we've gone through that, we can sell it on to uh, uh, to be actually built. Uh, in this case, we've been in conversation with a group. I, I don't want to mention them, given that we don't have an agreement in place. Uh, but they are uh, Warwickshire based, who would take on ownership of the project and uh, share the community. Sorry, sorry, share the profits with the community. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Councillor Kendall, next, please. I'm just trying to get an idea of what sort of things you farm currently. Is it just wheat and rapeseed oil at the moment on the rest of your land, including this part of the land? Um, on all of my ground at the moment, I've, I've got wheat, horsey rape, one of the fields in question, which is one that's destined for the solar park or not. Uh, it's currently uh, fallow because there is so much black grass on there, I cannot grow a crop on it this year. Um, and then a couple of my other fields are in grass. Okay, mainly, my, mainly for my daughter's livery. Okay, my follow-up question was really because it was mentioned during the presentation that it would be possible to graze sheep underneath the um, solar panels. Are you planning to switch into livestock and sheep sheep farming or not? I can't see any issue with grazing sheep under there at all. Are you planning to switch to that? I, as far as I'm aware, if we're allowed to graze sheep under it, we will be grazing sheep under it because it's it's the simplest and easiest way to control the grass. Yeah. Thank you. I keep it tidy. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Councillor Mills, next, please. Yeah, you've been, you've same been asked, question hasn't it? as uh, David, yes. <laughs> okay, any other speakers? Uh, oh, questions, I should say, sorry. No? In that case, to you both, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. And our final speaker on this item is Councillor Fitter. Good evening, Councillor Fitter. I think you know the drill. You'll have five minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning before your time is up. Whenever you're ready, settled, seated and good to go, the floor is yours. Great, good evening. Thank you, Mr Chairman. So um, this application isn't a debate on climate change and solar panels. Uh, tonight we are assessing this application against our core uh, policies and I'm here to, to object. So firstly, I'm really disappointed in the application and the consultation. Residents were promised local benefits, but all we have are negatives. Road chaos, a destruction to the landscape, and a loss of 111 football pitches worth of agricultural land. So for anyone watching the World Cup, you'll be able to understand how substantial that this is. So an area of concern for me is the location of this massive solar farm situated on a very narrow NDC road. The construction of the solar farm is going to cause chaos for local residents and road users. I don't think it's right for one of the biggest solar farms uh, to be going here. Our district and even my ward has a wealth of suitable sites and I think this is possibly one of the worst. Um, a local resident has provided me with some further information that I wanted to share about the entrance visibility display for this development. So the visibility display was shown on page 19 of the officer's report is 215 metres in each direction from the proposed entrance from a point 2.4 metres from the edge of the, high, the highway. The neighbouring property, which seems to have been ignored, has a boundary hedge that runs for 130 metres just next to the proposed entrance. So the visibility display requirements from highways cannot be met. And I would advise against highways altering someone else's private property without their permission. And I'm pretty certain that they don't and, want and won't have it. So another reason why the location is wrong is um, this development is going to be visible from Meon Hill which is one of the greatest and historic landscapes, I think, in Warwickshire, if not England. Um, and it's also enjoyed by the public. 
There's also visual impacts from the Ilmington Hills, which are in the AONB, and also visible from Foxcott Hill. It is also within a mile of another solar farm. So there's quite a substantial amount of landscape damage going on here. And I think that this proposal goes massively against CS5. Um, we've spoken a bit about agricultural lands today. Um, and again, we've lot, we're losing 147 acres of viable and productive land here. Use, um, and this goes against CS3. So I think that this application um, is in the wrong place and of the wrong size. Thank you. Councillor Fitter, thank you very much. Well within your five minutes. Um, members, do we have any questions for our ward member? Councillor Curtis, first of all. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Fitter. Um, you, you mentioned that there are other sites in your ward, other more suitable sites. Um, I mean, without asking you to go into any detail of those at all, um, would, they, would they be a, give a comparative sort of size to this? Yeah, yeah, I believe Do you think so. they would be... A, Proper yeah. alternatives. Yeah, thank you. Just remind members, we are obviously making the decision based on what's in front of us, not what is elsewhere or could be elsewhere. Thank you. Um, any other questions for our ward member? Councillor Mills. Um, Councillor Fitter, <coughs> um, you say it can be seen from AOMB? Yes. It can be? I, I think so, yeah. Uh, has that been established? No, no, it hasn't been established, okay. but I, I believe you can see it from, from the Ilmington Hills and, and also Milne Hill. As it well. can be. Okay, thank you. In my opinion. Okay, any other questions for Councillor Fitter? No, in that case, Councillor Fitter, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Thanks, Okay, so uh, we will now move to points of clarification of our officers. Members, do we have anything we would like clarifying from our officers, please? Councillor Parry, first of all, please. Um, thank you. A um, couple of things. On the visibility displays, um, Councillor Fitter highlighted that the hedgerow identified by Warwickshire Highways would need to be removed. Obviously, if that hedgerow is in the ownership of another landowner, um, then that visibility display could not be undertaken. Um, as far as the conditions are concerned, if we were um, minded to grant, um, would it be possible to ensure that that visibility display with obviously con with construction traffic coming in um, be completed prior to the commencement of construction? Um, certainly the, the access has to be carried out in accordance with the approved drawings. Um, the approved drawings identify a splay of 250 metres in either direction. The highway authority have been out and assessed the access position um, they are aware of the existing hedgerow treatments um, and they have clarified that if an existing hedgerow were to be encroaching on highway land, that there is a, a, you are able in order to trim back um, a hedgerow that's not in your ownership, if it's in, over, overgrowing onto highway land, then yes, you can, it can be trimmed back. But it's, from their opinion, it's um, displays could be achieved. Hence, there, um, no objection. I've also got another question regarding uh, the application with regard to the public right of way deviation. Um, again, with that, um, obviously there is it's an unknown quantity because we're waiting for um, the footpath people to come back. Again, is it, um, would it be reasonable if we were minded to grant to ask for construction to wait for that confirmation from the footpaths? Because obviously what we've got in front of us, I know that there's a proposal that say that they would allow some space if if the footpath had to be moved 
but we're trying to judge this application in terms of what is in front of us and I would just like some guidance whether the it, it's possible to await for the decision on the um, whatever it is called the DMMO yeah some uh, guidance on it please thank you the DMMO was submitted in 2005 it's still in process there is no indication when that will be determined and at the end of that process there's an appeal procedure which could be entertained so to withhold a consent on this application on the outcome of that process um, bearing in mind that the applicant has advised that in the event of um, uh, the diversion or, well sorry the modification order being um, accept, agreed um, they would um, put forward an amendment to the scheme if it was in or already be under construction they would uh, um, amend that so they could then accommodate for that uh, amended footpath route or they can apply for a footpath diversion order so any works could be done from a re retrospective yes. perspective thank you Okay, Councillor Rock, next, please. Thank you, Chairman. A couple of points uh, relating to uh, um, things that have been raised this evening. Uh, so we've got a con proposed condition 10, uh, details of lighting. I think uh, our objectors have been saying it will look like a, a, a logistics yard or something. But presumably, when if, if, if it was approved, those conditions would uh, address light pollution and so forth. So that would be considered by officers. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, the second point relates to community contributions that were mentioned uh, should the site <coughs> be sold on. And the, and the agent has said they're agents that, that, that are only acting as agents and, and there would be somebody else come along and operate it. I take it that's not something we have. We, we can't require a section 106 or something like that that something can be put forward. That's not, not in our control and would not be relevant to the application. That's that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. No problem at all. Councillor Mills, next, please. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, 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 Louise, I'm, I couldn't quite understand when Mr. Cowper was talking about the, um, actually didn't get the distance between the uh, closest uh, residential buildings, but what is the distance between the, the, the site and the closest residential the there are residential properties um my cursor doesn't seem to follow what you see uh, uh well, what's sorry the there. i just want to know what the distance is i haven't got a distance um immediately to hand it would okay. but the the site is is here the, the solar panels are proposed here um so it, it is in close proximity to the cottages mm. that they're, they're the closest ones and there, there is another property um, known as, um, apologies, it says, it says it's tranquil there, but it's not actually known as that anymore. Willow Lawn, thank you. Um, so those are the closest properties to the site. And, and right, we don't know just, okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or points for clarification? Councillor Curtis, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just one point of clarification, really. It's about the the measurement and the number of homes. And I, I believe I raised this before. Um, page 20 um, says the export capacity of the solar farm has been calculated to provide enough electricity to power around 14,100 homes. And in the next paragraph, it says this would be consumed locally. But the data from the business energy and industrial strategy for Stratford district gives quite different figures and on that basis it would be around ten and a half thousand homes now that may not necessarily be material to whether this panel uh, this committee <laughs> approves or not but i think if we are being told that this energy will be consumed locally then we should be looking at the figures for consumption within Stratford District, which are not the same as for the UK as a whole. We have asked that question in anticipation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, the figures for Stratford District 
aren't available, but they are for the region of the West Midlands region are different from the national figure, which is the, na the national figure which has been provided um, in the report is the 14,000. Um, apologies, I haven't got that. Where are we? 14,100. Mm. But for the West Midlands region, it goes down to 13,400 homes. And that uh, was requested from the agent. It's just that the, from the excellent um, presentation that councillors had on renewable energy, um, I've got here in front of me that data from the BIS, BEIS, and consumption per metre for domestic. But I think this is perhaps the Let's leave that for now, but I think we do need accurate or should have accurate data that relates to the district rather than more generally. May I just have other, a couple of other quick clarifications if I may yep. share. Um, page 32 of the report, um, it says that there could be long term employment associated with the maintenance of the equipment and that could be a benefit. <coughs> but um, do you have an estimate of how much long term employment would be generated? <coughs> And would that outweigh the loss of any traditional agricultural employment on this land? I would say that's that we don't have any specific numbers of in terms of employees that are going to be um, coming forward on the, on the site in terms of day to day maintenance. However, it's it's a it's a matter that members need to weigh up in terms of the planning balance. But if we if we're being asked to weigh it up. We're not actually being given any data on how many new jobs would be created or how many may be lost. There's no evidence to support that statement, actually. Um, Sorry, what, just to go back, what page was that this statement? This is page 32. Sorry, I went to 22. Sorry. 32, sorry. Where it says that there is a benefit from the scheme of long-term employment but I'm just asking really how much long term employment would be created and would that offset any loss of employment in traditional agriculture on the same land? It could be a zero gain. Sorry, I'm just thinking about this. Yeah, 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 that's one. Uh, yeah, no, no, I'm happy for you to say that. Um, I think, yeah, as Councillor Richard has said, ultimately, um, it, it, there is the potential there for some form of employment, but we don't have the exact figures to hand, so I wouldn't want to attribute too much weight okay, to that. So I, I, right. Um, finally, can I just ask for... Curtis. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we, this is a... Whilst this is a meeting in public, it's not public meeting, I'm hearing a lot of chatter from the crowd. I understand you're emotional about this, people have a view, etc., and you're here to voice that. We do need to be able to hear our officers so that we can make an informed decision. So if you could please refrain from chattering and shouting, I'd be very grateful. Councillor Curtis, sorry. Thank you, Jeff. Final point, I'll be very grateful. Um, if the um, development is sold on, on completion, can I just clarify who where the responsibility would lie for all the landscaping and all the conditions? The, the, the planning permission would lie with the land. So whoever ultimately takes the development on and brings it forward, they will have a duty to ensure that they comply with the, the planning conditions. Thank you very much. Okay. Do we have any more points of clarification? <laughs> Councillor Crump. <laughs> I'll be brief, I promise. Uh, it was mentioned by one of the speakers that uh, one of the reasons potentially not to grant this application is to do with breaches of uh, conditions. Can I just clarify that we're this is a planning committee and enforcement is a different part. Uh, so we're not looking to do with things that are enforceable. We're looking at the right to, uh, for planning approval, but not whether they're enforceable. Ultimately, when, when a condition is attached to a planning permission, there has to, de to be um, a degree of enforceability, but that is in the, the triggers and the wording. Um, and obviously, if you consider that the 
the condition that meets the relevant test. So it's it's supported by policy and it is ultimately going to mitigate or or make the development acceptable, then it's appropriate to put that condition on. The, there is obviously an enforcement process and they are governed by the council's enforcement plan as to when whether they take enforcement action. It's not for the, the decision maker to make an assessment at that point as to whether it's appropriate to put a condition on where there's an argument that on another site it, it wouldn't have been enforced because ultimately if you are putting the condition on, you are putting it on because you feel it's appropriate and then it would be enforced if it wasn't met. And we judge by its own merits on each individual scheme that comes forward. Is that right? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crump. Okay, unless the, anyone else has a final point of clarification, which I'm going to assume is a no, we'll move into debate. Let's move to debate. Who would like to kick us off? Councillor Kendall first, please. Thank you, um, right, I've, I've listened with interest throughout this, and I'll be honest, I've gone backwards and forwards with, with each speaker, to be honest with you. For me, this is one of those head versus heart situations. Um, nobody likes changes to the open countryside. No one likes to see things built or any changes made to you know, green and pleasant land like we have. Nobody likes that, obviously. But at the same time, you've got to be sensible. And I'm looking at this application, and I'm thinking, well, I can't. I can't find any material planning grounds to object. I can't see anything there. Um, nothing that's really strong. Um, and I'm minded that sometimes we do have to modernise. We have to move with times. What was a particular country rural scene 200 years ago would be completely unrecognisable to people today. The landscape changes over time. And I'm also satisfied that when it comes to the visibility of this site, that in 15 years' time or 20 years' time, it will no longer be as visible. And to a certain extent, people will have become used to it. It will have blended into people's idea of, of the countryside and these particular views. And we need to accept that farming and energy use changes over time. In this instance, I mean, look, I'm a history teacher. It wasn't so long ago that people were terrified that the seed drill would put farm labourers out of work. And it would change farming forever. Well, it didn't. People survived. Farming went on and improved. If farms sometimes are going to turn to solar panels, as a way of supplementing their income and, by the way, plugging the gap in terms of energy that we desperately need to do in this country. Well, this is probably a way of doing it. And this is why I asked my question to Mr Cowper earlier about his intentions towards sheep farming on that land. Well, I hope he is. Um, but I, I think, you know, that demonstrates then there would be the offset. You would still be able to use the land for agricultural purposes as well as producing a huge amount of energy. For me, Heart versus head, as I've said. Um, I'll be going with my head and making the sensible cho choice. And with that, I will propose grant. Thank you very much, Councillor Kendall. Councillor Parry, next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a very finely balanced application. Um, and like Councillor Kendall, I've listened to um, the objectors and also the applicant's agent. Um, but I've also um, drilled down to some policy issues as well. Um, the things that I don't, there is never any application that comes forward to us that doesn't, does not require a difficult decision to be made. And there are always pros and cons for any application that comes before us. Certainly one thing that does concern me is the impact on the residential amenity of the three cottages or the, the small housing unit that is right adjacent to the solar farm. You then look at the other side of the balance. We have the MPPF paragraph 152 um, making sure that we, we have to take positive steps towards renewable energy. We also have our own policy, which is CS3 on sustainable energy. And in particular, having listened to uh, Mr Cowper, one of the key things on the solar energy, what we have to look at is the impact on agricultural activities and disturbances to agricultural land. We've had it clear from um, Mr Cowper that that land isn't producing the sort of quality of crops it should be. We're all well aware of the terribly high increased costs of fertiliser 
Um, so looking from a completely balanced perspective, and I understand the views of the local community, and it is a balancing act, but at this moment in time, I am, because of the energy crisis, also, this is the third solar farm application that this committee has had to address in the last three months, I guess. Sure, it's three months. This is actually the smallest that has come forward. The previous two were 90 hectares, and I know because one was approved in my ward in New Bowl Pacey, which had a far greater impact on the medieval village conservation area of New Bowl Pacey. And that got approved, and that was considerably bigger than this. There was another application that got turned down because of its urbanisation on a small village. But I'm looking at this, yes, there are downsides, but I'm, I am going to be going with the office's recommendation and I will second Councillor Kendall's proposal. Thank you very much, Councillor Parry. Um, Councillor Curtis next, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I find I disagree very little with actually with what Councillor Perry and Kendall's have said. But the size of this, despite the fact that it is smaller, Councillor Perry, I, I accept that. Um, page 24 of the report, the site being proposed is significantly larger than the 25 hectares that should be in this area. It's, it's more than double that size and, and that really does give me cause for concern and then and looking back at policy cs5 um you know development takes place in a manner that minimizes and mitigates its impact proposals have regard to the local distinctiveness and character protect landscape character and avoid detrimental effects on features and i think for me it is a problem I, it's it this is just judgment of solomon these these applications um because it's to me because it's over double that size um i'm finding it difficult to su support support the recommendation at the moment thank you chair uh, i'm going to assume from what you've said that you are sitting on the fence at the moment <laughs> you are not going to propose the counter proposal yeah. at this stage lovely thank you councillor crump next please yeah i'll try and be brief again and again it's a very difficult <clears throat> one um and again, um, I, I've tried to look at this dispassionately, uh, and that's why I did try and speak to the agent and the landowner. And what was pertinent to me is the actual usage of the land. Firstly, the wheat and the rape is either being used for ethanol or in the, make, in the making of plastics. It doesn't seem to be going towards food production. And pardon the pun, pardon the farming analogy, we got this from the horse's mouth. So I, I think we do need to make sure we're making decisions on the facts we've got in front of us. Again, the land is mainly 3B. When you look at the quality and the, the classifications, it's not particularly great. It's OK, but not particularly great. If it was 3A or even 2, I would be concerned. And the other point that came out is the invasive weed, which is, again, making this farm more difficult to be profitable. So then again, we move on to the viability of the farm. So one, it's an added income. Two, there's some form of diversification going into sheep farming, and therefore they will be producing actually food for the country, not ethanol or things for plastics. So, you know, it's finely balanced, but I do think the, the need for both few, food, uh, sorry, fuel security will be met by this and potentially food security as well with sheep grazing and the maintenance, maintaining the viability of a farm, which could potentially go out of business because it's unprofitable because of the invasive weight. So I will be supporting the application. Councillor Crump, thank you very much. Councillor Dixon next, please. Um, I did notice on the uh, on the map on uh, page 35 that the Shakespeare's Way just uh, just touches the uh, the side of Crimsky up there. So uh, as I walked that earlier in the year, I uh, I spotted it. Um, but nevertheless, I am a rambler, and I've uh, often walked from Hidcote along uh, 
the escarpment and uh, through Foxcombe. And I have to say that there may be some solar farms which can be seen from there, but I didn't notice any. And I think for it to be really prominent, it should have been a blot on the landscape. And I don't think they are. And therefore, I will be supporting the officer's recommendation. I think this one is sufficiently far enough away not to be an object on the, uh, on the landscape, Chairman. Thank you very much. <laughs> Councillor Foreman, next, please. Listen to all of the speakers. I've listened to everything that, that my fellow councillors have said, and I completely agree. It is a head and heart decision, but I've weighed up everything that's been said. I've written it all down. I've thought about it, and I will be supporting the application. Thank you very much, Councillor Mills. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at um, page 25 and the second paragraph. Um, Council's landscape officer considers the proposed development is likely to cause a significant effect on the landscape. And we go down to the last one. Uh, I, I acknowledge that the application will cause a level of harm. There is harm here, uh, Mr. Chairman. I can't say I'm, I'm all in favour. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit torn, but I think there is a harm to the landscape here, Mr. Chairman. So um, I'll see what anybody else has to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that's everyone apart from myself and Councillor Redden. I'm not going to add anything because I think anything I want to say has been said. Councillor Redden, have you got anything you want to say? If not, we'll move to a vote. Oh, Councillor Curtis, you, got one, you want to come back? One more. Yes, please, if I may, Chair. Were, were we minded to approve, um, just looking at the Alderminster Parish Council, uh, requesting condition if permission granted, this is on page 15, passing places between the A3400 and Bridget Wimston and provision of a footpath from Wimpston to the A3400. There will be, regrettably, if this does go ahead, a, a, a very large increase in HGVs down that stretch of road. And currently there is no footpath from the A3400 to Wimpston. So I think if it were to go ahead, I think there would be a safety issue there if there were no footpath. Okay, understood. Um, Okay, so we, we have a proposal. Uh, the proposal is to grant in line with the officer's recommendation made by Councillor Kendall, seconded by Councillor Parry. Um, we will move to that vote. Could I please have a show of hands for those in favour of granting application 2102017 FUR? I make that eight. And those against? Two. Committee therefore resolves to grant application 2102017 FUR land at Crimpscote in Winston. <laughs> now, um, I appreciate most people in the gallery will probably be wanting to go now, so we will take a five minute break, hopefully less than that, while everyone makes them their way out of the building.
Yeah. Right, okay, let's, uh, let's make a start, shall we, if that's okay? Just wait for us to come back live again. Right, okay, I've taken over from Councillor Richards for a bit. So, we can move then to item five on, a, on the agenda tonight. This is application reference uh, 22 slash 02318 slash FUL. This is for Toad Hall, the Green, Snitterfield, Warwickshire. Uh, the description then for construction of a stable block and outdoor riding arena. Presenting officer, Victoria Kempton. Over to you. Thank you. So, the application site is located approximately one kilometre to the southwest of Snitterfield Village Centre and is marked by the black dot on the map. The land has been assessed as being in equestrian use, which lies in the open countryside, Greenbelt and Arden Special Landscape area. In terms of the context, the site is an open parcel of land where the neighbouring properties include an equestrian facility to the north, commercial businesses to the east with barn conversions and the application dwelling beyond, whilst a further dwelling and barn conversion lie to the west. Finally, open countryside lies to the south. Planning permission is sought for a stable block and riding arena, as indicated on the site plan, which would utilise the existing field access. The arena would measure 60 metres by 25 metres with a sand and fibre surface and surrounding timber post and rail fence. In terms of the floor plan, the building would have six stables, a tack room and hay barn, which would be arranged around a central courtyard hard standing area. The location plan shows the location of uh, stables here, and a field shelter here, which are to be removed. This slide shows the design of the proposed building, which will be finished with a natural gay, grey fibre cement roof with concrete block, con sorry, concrete block work walls and timber boarded windows. Stable doors will be present on the inner side of the building, whilst the canopy roof would link the two halves of the building. In terms of the scale, the building would have a height of 3.5 metres, length of 29.8 metres and a width of 13 metres, resulting in a footprint of approximately 220 square metres when including the canopies. This slide shows, shows the surrounding context more clearly, with the site lying here. You can also see how the site acts as a break in the built form for road users, as discussed in the report. The existing stables, which are located off Gospel Oak Lane, are located here whilst the section of the A46 runs along here. These photos were taken inside the site with photo number one looking towards the development area with the neighbouring developments shown in the background. Photo number two was taken from near to the entrance with views to the west with a highway to the right of the photo. Photo number three was taken in a similar position to, to number two showing the surrounding land to the south which is open in character providing long distance views of the, of the development. You can see from this photo how the levels of the land rise in that direction. The first photo is a view looking to the site from the green showing the access to the development. It would also show the rural character and locality and how the proposed development would be read from the public realm. Two photos to the right show the four stables which are to be removed. The application is recommended for refusal for the reason outlined in the officer's report. A member's site visit took place on Monday as listed in the site um, update sheet. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we can go to our first speaker on this application. Uh, Councillor Corinne Elliott from Snitterfield Parish Council. Hello. Please excuse my voice for this. It's, uh, I've got work. I've got to go around at the moment. Oh, don't worry, I think most people have. <laughs> don't worry, it's fine. Take a seat. Right, well, uh, you, well you'll have three minutes um, to, to speak to the committee. If you'd remain seated for, uh, for any questions at the end, um, I'll give you a warning at the last 30 seconds, if that's okay, just so you can know to wrap up. Does right. this switch on? We can already hear you. It's perfect. Oh, don't worry, okay. just speak nicely into the, into the mic. Over to you whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. The Parish Council considers it would be helpful to list all the positive and compliant planning facts confirmed in the planning report before members. AS10 core strategy permits equestrian related activities in open countryside. G6 development requirements SPD must be of appropriate size for animal welfare. NDP ALW4 protects and enhances sport and recreational facilities. NDP B1, responding to local character. The design and the proposed materials are compatible with the distinctive character of the area. 
In addition, the development would be well screened from view by existing hedgerows and is on, not unduly forward of the building line. The density is in keeping with the character of the surrounding development in that there are existing substantial equestrian facilities in separate ownership immediately opposite this site. NDP BE4, designed to reduce crime. NDP IN2, drainage and flooding water, no harm in flood zone one. NDP IN3, highway safety, highways have no objections. Climate change checklist, compliant. Special landscape area, it will not be harmed. Residential immunity, not impacted and support from immediate neighbours. All the above demonstrates that the development is acceptable. However, core strategy policy CS10.10 states that any development in the green belt is harmful unless very special circumstances are demonstrated to mitigate the perceived harm. The parish council considers that the applicant has provided sufficient special circumstances to mitigate the perceived harm to the green belt particularly regarding the welfare of their horses and reducing crime. In addition, the applicant has been very careful to cite the development next to the built form, being the most suitable location to reduce any impact on the green belt. The Parish Council hopes that members are minded to support this application. However, if support is given, the Parish Council requests conditions that external lighting is restricted and the existing four stables and the field, shape, field shelter removed. I was just about to give you a 30 second warning. That's fantastic. Oh, right. <laughs> thank you very much. OK, do we have any questions, please, Parish Council? Councillor Rock. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Good evening. Um, I, I listened carefully to what the officer said. Possibly I misunderstood it when she talked about a cement board finished. And then you said the finish was completely compatible with the surroundings, whereas the other, uh, we, we went and I went on the site visit and the existing stables are sort of clapperboard type finish. Could you comment on that if you think that's appropriate, the cement board is appropriate um, or have I got that wrong? Uh, actually, I'm not sure about that. Okay, thank you. Perhaps a question for the applicant later. Yeah. Councillor Parry. Nice to see you. Um, I also attended the site visit and I noticed there were buildings to the right of the application site, buildings to the left of the application site and buildings opposite the application site. Um, my question therefore is, does the parish council view the site as infill, as an infill location in view of the the buildings to the right and the left and opposite. Yes, I mean, it could possibly be seen as infill. Yes, thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions from the committee. Oh, one more, sorry, Councillor Curtis. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, you mentioned uh, that the Parish Council would like to see, um, be, be assured that the lighting wasn't going to be intrusive and yes. the, the existing stables would be removed. Yes. Are you aware, are the applicants happy with those? As far as I know, the applicants are happy with that, but I'm sure they'll fill you in when they come on. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Oh, Councillor, it's Thank you. Um, at the moment, the, the horses are stabled on the those two stables. I could I could see. Um, with this new um, equestrian centre, would it be more it would obviously be more secure than what's there already? Because that's right next to the um, road, isn't it? Totally more secure. The new yeah. equestrian, yeah, what's okay. intended, yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. Um, and that's part of the, um, I say about crime, uh, it complies with uh, NDPB for to reduce crime. Thank you. Thank you. In that case, I think, thank you very much from the committee as well. You, you, can, you can return now to your previous seat. Thank you. Thank we'll you. go to our next um, speaker then, which is Steve Bromley, the agent for the applicant, and Laura Turner, the applicant herself. have three minutes. Uh, how do you want to break this down between the two of you? We're going to uh, share the three minutes. It's not very long. I'm just going to make a very brief introduction and then hand it over to Laura. Well, that's fantastic. Well, you have three minutes. Okay. Over to you. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you, Chairman. This is the second application we have submitted and represents a reduction in the size of the building from the first application. We welcome that officers have sought to negotiate, however, an additional reduction in the size of the building by removing two bays would make no discernible difference to preserving the openness of the green belt. Now, interestingly, on page 43, third paragraph, I'd ask you to note that the planning officers consider the development is acceptable with regard to landscape impact. So I'll, I'll hand over to Laura at that point. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening. I'm Laura Turner and with my family we moved into Toad Hall in September last year. I thank you for the opportunity to briefly talk on my planning application. Uh, born on a farm, horses have always been part of my life and for my daughter the same is true. She has chosen a career working with horses having completed an equine degree at university. Um, she works locally for Dan Skelton and Gina Ellis and she exercises, trains and competes her own two horses. Her BE record, which is mentioned in the report, would show these competitions. But if you add in unaffiliated events, the locally run Cotswold Cup, show jumping, dressage and pony club competitions were out at 30 plus events a year. It's a huge, huge commitment. When we assess what facilities did exist at Toad Hall, we used criteria of suitability as it related to the equine welfare of the six horses we do own, security of ground maintenance equipment and horse tap, personal safety and sustainability. There are just a few insights I want to share with you. The two old ponies we do keep are in the existing past their end of life stables that have been pointed out on the map. These are probably approximately 400 metres from the house and directly off Gospel Oak Lane, which is approximately 50 metres from the A46. At 2 a.m. in the morning, when the ponies are ill and I go to check on them, having had the vet out, I feel very vulnerable. As our application states, there's no electricity and sadly, on numerous occasions, vans or cars do stop in that gateway and use it as a toilet. There's no getting around that. On sustainability, the 300 plus bales of hay from the grassland this summer, we were only able to keep 50 because we have nowhere to store them. 30 on, seconds. Oh, on security, we have no tractor, harrow or roller. Tap rooms now are concrete line to stop thieves breaking in. We have nowhere to keep the tap and equipment. So in summary, as a family, we want to responsibly provide quality facilities for the six horses we do own and collectively bring them back to the uh, proposed development. Thank you. With six seconds to spare. Thank you. OK, uh, any questions from the committee, please? Councillor Rock and Councillor Crump. Oh, I've gone first again. Yeah. Uh, nice to see your agent again. Uh, um, um, I'm going to ask the same question and I'll probably ask the officers this as well. Um, it's, it says in here, officers sought to negotiate amendment. It's in, it sounds like that was reduction in size, but it's the finish that I'm interested in. Did that negotiation include the finish? Uh, and uh, if, this, if it's cement board, which it appears to be, uh, would it not be better in some natural material that accords more with the uh, green belt, etc.? cetera? And, and would you be uh, interested in a condition that's suggested a different finish? Well, um, I mean, obviously you can, you can speak to the planning officer, but we were never requested to change the materials. And in fact, it's it's concrete block work, which is, uh, it's the same material as the large building on the opposite side of the lane, the, the very large building, it's exactly the same materials. So it, it sort of matches in the very Okay, got my answer. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Crump. It's a shame we couldn't arrange for better weather when we went on the side oh, visit. Yeah. I think we've just about dried up, haven't we, Councillor Rock? So, uh, um, obviously, what struck me there was one um, the location being far away, it was uphill, past loads of mole hills, and I can imagine that's quite challenging walking there in the pit till I am. Um, what you mentioned you've got six horses, uh, six um, apologies, I've mixed up horses and found myself. To apologise. Um, would that enable this new block enable you to staple them more together? Yes, so they're currently spread out. The, the two that were there are the two old ponies, you know, of this height. Um, three are twice the size, you know, five foot eight, five foot nine to the shoulder with a head beyond that. 
um, they're currently stabled, stabled locally, and there's one we moved from Hertfordshire, there's one that still remains in Hertfordshire. So this would be consolidating them all um, into the proposed development, which is why I was very keen to continue with the, the six stable application. And you weren't referring to Councillor Rock and I when you mentioned the two old terms then. No. no. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any further questions? Councillor Parry. Good evening. Um, I, I was just interested to know whether the um, whether there are any potential plans for economic development from if if you if you were successful in, in getting this um, application granted and in terms of would there be any jobs um, arising from such a facility? So we, we've, we've talked about this and it's, it's, it's our personal, it's personal use. I'm not looking at running a business or incurring business rates. Um, so, you know, very much um, they would be looked after by us. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's the right answer to say I don't envisage there would be a job, but as I say, I'm not looking to take on board running a business and the necessary insurance and everything that, that goes with that in employing people. That's fine. Yeah, Councillor Harvey. <clears throat> um, good evening. Um, I wonder if you could say something about uh, the threat of crime locally. Um, I think that's a powerful reason you've put forward in justification. It would help me to understand the threat. Uh, if you could say something about, are there thefts from of TAC? Are there, have there been incidents of car theft uh, locally, uh, assaults or whatever? I'm just trying to get a, a sense of how real that threat, although it's, I, 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 I accept the perception of the of threat is, is real. I'd like to know if you've got any experience of actual crime in the area. So our neighbours had their Range Rover stolen two months ago. So um, that's a very real, happened very locally. Um, I, I, read, I read about rural crime. I see, you know, the recommendations for the tap rooms having the concrete ceilings, where we keep the horses at the moment. You know, there's, the, I think she had an incident and she now has a, a caged environment within the tap room to stop the tap being stolen. So I haven't got specific crime figures, but I could, um, you know, for the area or for the postcode, but it's, um, I see quad bikes stolen, um, et cetera. Next door is pretty close though. Yes, next door's car was close. Thank okay, you. any other questions? In that case, thank you both very much for your time. I would just, before we invite the member, just remind members that obviously we don't have you know um, what's called substantiated figures for crime levels in the area we only have what the applicants told us no reason not to believe you but i just need to point that out right uh ward member you're already here good evening councillor richards you have five <coughs> minutes over to you thank you very much uh members i'd like to start by thanking those of you who braved the wind and the rain on monday it wasn't pleasant for any of us um but thank you very much for that i hope you found it useful i'm really grateful for your uh, your attendance you'll know from the officer's report that the, the key reason in essence is a green belt reason for refusal you'll also know that the fundamental purpose of the green belt as set out in paragraph 137 of the mppf is to prevent urban sprawl it goes on to provide exceptions to green belt policy in paragraph 149 which is supported by our own core strategy cs10 and specifically identifies the following as exemptions limited infill in villages limited infill or partial or complete redevelopment of previously developed land, and the provision for appropriate facilities for outdoor sport and recreation, provided, of course, it preser preserves the openness of the Greenbelt. Failing that, special circumstances would be required. One can comfortably argue that one or all of those exemptions apply to the proposed development site. To the northwest of the site, so directly opposite, lies Avon Croft Stud Farm, an equestrian facility, to the northeast of the site lies a combination of commercial and residential buildings, and to the southwest lies a further residential property. The site itself is the current home to a number of horses whose stable blocks are proposed to be removed as part of this application. To my mind, this clearly fits the definition of infill and the partial redevelopment of previously developed land. 
It is also clear that the proposal is for an equestrian use and as such is supported as a provision for outdoor sport and recreation. Indeed, this latter point is confirmed by the case officer who in a reason for refusal identifies that the proposal is for outdoor sport and recreation. She does go on to say that in her opinion, the proposal would not preserve the openness of the Greenbelt. That is subjective. And to my mind, the proposal would preserve the openness of the green belt, particularly given the existing stable blocks are to be removed. Those of you who attended the site visit will know that the land slopes away from the A46 and down towards the siting of the proposal. That has the effect of reducing the impact of the proposal on the openness of the green belt, but also moves the horses closer to the existing equestrian facility at Avoncroft Stud Farm and crucially away from the A46. That has the effect clearly of improving the animal's welfare. So to my mind, this proposal should be supported as an exemption to the Greenbelt policy, either because it represents limited infill in our villages or because it represents limited infill of previously developed land for the same use, or because it represents an appropriate facility for outdoor sport and recreation. And for the reasons I've set out, the proposal does preserve the openness of the Greenbelt. However, if you disagree with me on any of those, the proposal can be supported with special circumstances. We've already heard about prevention of crime. I would add to that that the land is previously developed for the same use. The existing equestrian facilities have come to the end of their useful life and are no longer adequate to, save, to safely house horses. And the sighting of the proposal brings the horses away from the A46 and Gospel Oak Lane, improving the animal's welfare, but also the safety of other road users. Members, I trust you'll agree with me that this proposal is appropriate for its rural location. It does not represent urban sprawl or the merging of villages. It represents one of three exemptions I've set out and that it does not uh, impinge on the openness of the Greenbelt. With parish council support, ward member support, no objections from statutory consultees or neighbours, I trust you are able to support this application too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any questions for the ward member? No, got off lightly. Thank you very much. Okay, <laughs> we'll see. Um, okay, so um, any uh, we go to points of clarification. Do we have any questions for the officer, Councillor Dix? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Victoria, um, on page forty-two, halfway down, we've got officers sought to negotiate amendments to the scheme. I think we heard from uh, Steve Bromley that there was a suggestion of a reduction in the number of units being combined there. If uh, they had, as it were, acceded to that, would the recommendation be different? Um, I can't say what the recommendation would be without seeing plans. Um, but the, the issues with the current application is due to its scale. Um, we did also seek amendments regarding the siting um, as well. Um, but we'd have to view a case upon submission if it was smaller. Thank but you. it would certainly reduce the harm. Okay. Councillor Rock. It's the same question as I've already asked twice, but I'll now ask the officers about the finish. Uh, is it possible to condition something to do with the finish to make it more appropriate to the location so we mitigate any harm to the setting? If, if, we, if, if the committee was minded to grant it. It's listed on the plans, as I understand it. In theory, you could do a notwithstanding, so notwithstanding details on the approved plans regarding materials. They could be um, submitted um, prior to the commencement of development for consideration. Obviously, if councillors were minded to approve and were minded to put a condition of that nature on, as it would be a pre-commencement condition, it would have to be agreed by the applicants, but that could be delegated to officers to do. Um, Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, officers. Any other questions or points of clarification, I should say? Wow, OK. Let's go to the debate. Who wants to start off? Councillor Ed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'm quite comfortable that this, as outlined by Councillor Richards, is kind of infill and absolutely definitely for sports and recreation. So. I'd be very, very keen to support this application, I think. So I'm happy to propose that if someone would like to back me up on that. Fantastic. We'll go to Councillor Rock. Uh, yes, I, I, I find I'm in agreement with uh, Councillor Richard's uh, explanation. 
uh, and uh, I'm happy to support what Councillor Eden said, but I I'm concerned about two things. Uh, one is light pollution, which has been mentioned in here. So if we were to approve it, I would like to see a condition about external lighting um, uh, so that there is no nuisance lighting. Uh, and we, I think we have a standard condition for that. And secondly, I think we've heard that it is, it is possible to, to do something about the, uh, the finish. Uh, I'm not suggesting we change the block work, but at least we do something to, by negotiation, to ensure it is not intrusive. We don't end up with a white cement block in the middle of the field. And um, I'm not quite sure what we can do, but I defer to officers. And on the assumption we can deal with that by condition, I, I would, um, I'm afraid, disagree with the officer's recommendation and propose we support it. Sorry, was that formally seconding? Yes. Thank you, just checking. Um, okay, we go to Councillor Parry. Ben Mills. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's green belt applications are always very interesting um, and they cause us all to make sure we do our own homework, revisiting the MPPF, revisiting our own policies. Um, but I do feel on this occasion, um, I'm not surprised that the Parish Council um, are supporting this application. We have a situation where we haven't got any, any objections. Um, what to me is really crucial is, is personal safety in particular, um, and also the safety and welfare of the horses. Um, I take on board Councillor Rock's um, concern about lighting. However, I think it's very important there is some element of security lighting because if um, a member of the family has to go out at night, then there needs to be some form of security lighting. Um, we're all keen on dark skies and I know Councillor Rock is a great advocate of that. From a building perspective, I'm actually perfectly happy with what is proposed in the in the application because actually it sits very um, well with the equestrian facility opposite which was the thinking behind and then I think actually if it was to come forward with a dip with some form of cladding in wood or something it would actually stand out more um, and it would have a, 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 a larger impact on the landscape so I I'm very happy to support this application but as is with without um, interference to a change in the uh, construction materials. I also feel it's, it's definitely infill from my perspective. As a committee, we have, you know, put residential buildings on infill sites. This is clearly infill. Um, it supports agricultural. It promotes um, personal safety. <coughs> and reduces crime, so fully in support. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, um, I agree. It's, I can see no substantial harm here. Um, one of the things is it will improve the well welfare of the horses, um, you know, stuck right on the, the edge of the field there, which can easily be stolen or whatever. Um, but yeah, I can't see any significant harm here. And I have to say that Councillor Corin Elliott uh, did a quite a, um, convincing report there. So uh, thank you for that. So unfortunately, or fortunately, I'll be against this officer's recommendations. Mr. Chairman, I will be supporting. Thank you. I think, sorry, does anybody else wish to come in? Yes, Councillor Dixon. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Greenbelt, infill, built up area boundaries are the thing that uh, springs to my mind and this is not in uh, a built up area boundary uh, therefore it's stretching uh, the definition to a certain extent uh, but nevertheless I can see other merits in this application. Thank you Chairman. Thank you very much. Councillor Harvey. I just wanted to say that uh, this is where the site visit was extremely important. Um, to see the map flat on on a page is one thing to see the ground is, is quite another and I think the the biggest factor was the slope from top to bottom this application will get rid of um, the existing uh, stables which I think is a is a distinct benefit um, the question of infill is to some as Councillor Parry has mentioned can sometimes be a matter of degree um, I can think of instances where there are quite 
considerable distances between properties, it would be difficult to argue that it was in, Phil, in this instance, given the setting, given the purpose, I don't have any difficulty. I feel sorry for the officer. That I understand why she made her recommendation, but I'm with the majority of the committee. I will, I will support this. Okay. Um, should we try and sum up? Um, I, I've had a quick chat over here. I think what we're trying to say, and I'm going to go to our proposer in a second, see if he's happy with this. I think what we're saying is we feel this is in line with the exceptions to CS10, in that we do think this is, there's no harm to the openness of the open countryside, and we regard this to be a form of agricultural infill. Um, is that wording acceptable? Do you need more than that? I think obviously the, the, the definition of infill relates to infill in villages. Obviously this isn't within a village. However, from what councillors have been saying, I've, I've, I've noted that when you've discussed the matter of the infill, you're talking about the, the equestrian use opposite. Mm -hmm. And the fact that that leads you to think that there's no harm, you've also noted that the, the site soaks up. So I'm, I'm, what I'm taking from that is that because of the location of it, you don't feel that there's any harm to the character of, and openness of the green belt. Am I correct in that's what you've been? I think, it's, I think there's a lot of nods around the room. I'll go to Councillor Edding because you proposed it and you're happy with that. That's what you yes, want your bill. You. Same sort of thing. The only thing is, I, 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 it sounds like we may not be content with the lighting condition, and I'll just point out to Councillor Parry, the lighting condition doesn't preclude us doing something with security lighting. It's a pro, it can be considered by the officers at the time. What we don't we want flood lights on all the time, but I think reactive lighting yeah, is one thing. I think that's what we're I, I don't know where you know if there's no support for trying to do something with the appearance of the building, we will. We, we will act on the good offices of the applicant not to do something that's outrageous. No doubt they won't. So I will withdraw that uh, suggestion well, if, that's, that, if that's helpful. So if we withdraw that, but we, we then go to the next set, which is, do we have a set of standard conditions? Because I can see which way this is going. And I'm, I'm guessing lighting will be one of those conditions. Um, the office has already um, prepared a couple of conditions that we thought councillors might want to include. Obviously, we've got the standard time, standard plans um, and the materials to be in accordance with the plans because they are detailed on the plans. Um, we've also um, acknowledged that the location plan um, indicates that the, there are stables that would be removed, so we would have a condition on that they would be um, removed as identified on the location plan. Um, and we've also included a condition um, that the building and riding arena um, to be used solely for private recreational purposes, um, in keeping with what has been uh, proposed as part of the application. No waste to be burnt on any part of the application site. Um, and that there are a number of conditions in respect of um, the development should not be occupied until the vehicular access and vehicle turning area. Um, and obviously words could be delegated to officers to finalise the actual details of that, but it's in respect of um, vehicles not um, leaving and re-entering the public highway, so they should be leaving and re-entering in a forward gear, sorry. Um, and then also prior to the erection, um, installation uh, of any external lighting, so we have included that um, details of the external lighting to be submitted. Um, and approved in writing um, and we've also asked we would also ask I should say as part of that um, details to include things like the, the equipment supporting structures positions um, sizes heights um, the light intensity illumination so it would help with um, some of the concerns that were raised in regard to that also matters like hours of lighting um, and then obviously a climate change checklist was submitted in support of the application so that would be uh, included um, and then there would also be a couple of um, standard informatives that we see, look to include which is the MPPF positive proactive statement um, and the nesting bird statement um, and I believe highways also requested an informative um, regarding the visibility space. Is there anything else that councillors feel? I think that's a pretty exhaustive list actually, so I'm, I'm, I'm content. I'm getting a lot of nods from around the room. <laughs> right, well, we've got our reasons, we've set those out, we've got a set of conditions, we have a proposal which has been seconded. Should we go to the vote? So the proposal then is to grant this in line with everything that's been said tonight and the conditions attached. All those in favour, please show. I don't need to count. Unanimous. So therefore, the committee resolves to grant application reference 22 23 18 slash FUL 
and I will vacate the chair and invite Councillor Richards back. Okay, we've lost Trevor. Ladies and gents, we, we, it is eight o'clock now. We have two more applications to get through. According to Constitution, we've got to start the second one before eight o'clock, um, unless we all agree in discretion, but we need to focus on this. So, sorry, 8.30. I should have said not eight o'clock because it is eight o'clock now. Um, okay, so our next application is uh, 2202164 FUL. That's Treadington Hill Barnes in Treadington Ships on a Stour. Um, our presenting offer is Stuart Piper. Stuart, whenever you're ready, over to you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Chairman. So the proposal that is before members is for demolition of two agricultural buildings and the erection of a new dwelling. So you have the location plan here in front of you. You can see the site itself is denoted by a black dot here. So we have the Fossway, which runs uh, north to south, directly adjacent to the site. Uh, as you can see, the site is surrounded by uh, open countryside, uh, approximately 1.5 kilometres south, uh, southwest of Trennington. And you have a footpath which runs to the west of the site and then running to the north. And then we have uh, another uh, a picture of the site plan here. So you have, you can see that the site itself is um, with the red line area denoted here. And you have the agricultural barn which is to be demolished here. And then uh, Opposite the application site and adjacent to the Fossway, you have a electricity distribution site. Uh, and then we just have an aerial image here. Again, you can see the uh, red line area outlined in red here. And again, you can see the uh, larger agricultural barn, which is to be demolished here. Uh, so there is an extant permission on site to convert the existing large agricultural building into, into two dwellings under Class Q of the General Permitted Development Order. Uh, and then we just go on to a proposed site plan here. So this is the proposed dwelling, as you can see here. Uh, as you can see, it has a fairly simple rectilinear form. Um, adjacent to the site, um, which might be quite difficult to see for members on the screen, but there is a red dashed outline, uh, which is the footprint of the existing barn. Uh, and then we just go on to some of the proposed elevations here. Um, and as you can see that you've got a front elevation here, so this will face towards the Fossway. Um, as you can see uh, from the south elevation, the proposed dwelling has a fairly simple shallow dual pitched form. Uh, in terms of height, the height of the dwelling is 6.6 .6 metres, which is 300 millimetres taller than the existing agricultural building, building on site. Uh, just to give you a bit of context and comparison, again, it might not be too easy to see on the screen, but you have a green dashed outline here. So this is the outline of the proposed dwelling, which was um, proposed dwelling at the site that was previously refused by members uh, at committee back in April. And then we just have some more elevations here of the proposed dwelling. Uh, in terms of the material palette, we've got uh, concrete render, standing seam cladding and native timber cladding. Uh, and then we just go on to uh, the approved elevations of the fallback position here. Uh, and now we just go on to uh, some images of the site. So this uh, image is from the lay-by, which is directly adjacent to the Foss Way. So we're looking into the site and you have the large agricultural barn, which is to be demolished here. 
and then we have another uh, site image. So this is just from within the application site, and again, looking towards uh, the agricultural barn um, facing away from the Fosway. And then we go on to, uh, the, so these are some um, Google Street images, uh, Street View image, images. So this is facing to the north. And then you have the lay by here. So you can just sort of see the access here and the site is off to the right. And then we have another Google Street View image, which is looking south. Uh, and then you have the application site just off, off the screen to the left hand side here. Uh, just helps to give a bit of context in terms of the uh, boundary vegetation. So in summary, the proposed demolition of the two agricultural barns and the erection of a new dwelling does not comply with the relevant provisions of policy AS10 in terms of residential development. However, relevant to the decision is the existence of a fallback position to convert the larger agricultural buildings to two dwellings. Officers consider this to be of material relevance in the assessment of this application and significant weight should be afforded. This fallback position weighs in favour of the proposed dwelling and as such it is recommended that planning permission is granted. Thank you, Chairman. Stuart, thank you very much indeed. Let's call our first speaker on this item, who is Councillor Harvey. Uh, speaking on behalf of Treddington Parish Council. Uh, Councillor Harvey, you're very well versed in, uh, in how this works. So three minutes, 30 second warning, whenever you're set and comfortable. Oh, I'm speaking on... You're speaking on behalf of Treddington Parish Council right now. Uh, I'm not speaking then. Thank you. OK, that makes life a little bit easier. Um, OK, in that case, we'll call our next speaker on the item, who is Dan Pierce and Piers Brooks. I have here. Good evening, gentlemen, and welcome. Now, I've got you down for three minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning. Are you, is one of you going to speak in the other's questions? Yeah, or? that's correct. I'm going to speak and then appear for questions. OK, in that case, I'll give you a 30 second warning. Whenever you're set and comfortable and ready to go, the floor's yours. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Pierce, here on behalf of my wife and I for this application to build a forever home after my wife moved locally for work. Following on from the planning officer's comments, I reiterate we addressed the cited previous reasons for rejection in full. There's a considerable reduction in height, there's simplified built form and site layout with a less contemporary material palette to represent a modern agricultural barn in keeping with the existing character. This new application has a 22% reduction in volume compared to the class Q, 8% reduction in glazing and restrictions on urbanization and domestication through the curtilage controls. And I want to address some of the content of the objection letters for this application. I can confirm that we're not looking to mislead the members. There is a 22% reduction in volume. The smaller second barn on, on site that is not part of the class Q approval is, included, is not included in this value. The planning officer's report supports this application is betterment to the existing with respect to ecology, biodiversity, landscape and climate change. We have modified the appearance in response to the committee's feedback with a smaller volume, smaller footprint, less contemporary appearance of agricultural character and restrictions in place to prevent any domestication. I also want to draw the committee to the existing precedents and planning consistency and continuity with other approved applications utilising the class Q fallback listed in the officer's report. A net reduction of dwellings is of material relevance. The property is half a kilometre from the nearest footpath with all views screened due to the topography of the land. There are no long distance views um, of the barn. It is glimpsed briefly from the existing access. The highways department raises no objection and the access to the property is that ex under existing grant for the class Q. Therefore, in conclusion, we fully agree with the officer's report and recommendation for approval. Significant weight should be afforded to the class Q fallback position and that this proposed development is considered less harmful and more sustainable than the existing fallback in terms of design, character, landscape, ecology, biodiversity and sustainability. Consideration must be given to planning decision cons consistency and continuity with previous applications under the exact same circumstances using the class Q fallback together with enforceable betterment conditions. Therefore, we respectfully request permission is granted for this amended proposal. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Well within your time. Members, do we have any questions either for our applicant or for his architect? No? 
in that case, both of you, thank you very much for your time and contributions this evening. Thank you. And of course, your patience as well. This time we will hear from Councillor Harvey. Councillor Harvey, then when, once you're settled and ready, you'll have five minutes. We'll give you a 30 second warning. Use as much or a little of that time as you wish. Um, as soon as you're settled, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. There's merit in the principle of redundant agricultural buildings, most notably dis disused barns, having their useful lives prolonged by their conversion to residences in appropriate circumstances and settings. The provision of the possibility of a conversion under a Class Q application was intended just for this purpose. It was not provided as a backdoor route to the building of a new residence in the open countryside. But for the extent uh, extent, extent of Class Q consent in this instance, this application would certainly be refused because it would be a building devoid of any exceptional quality or design characteristics, neither would it make any positive contribution to the character of the local area. As such, it would fail to comply with the Council's relevant po policy designated to protect the open countryside AS10. There is no expressed local support for this application. Not a single resident has written to support it. The Parish Council has repeated its objection, as it did in relation to the preceding application, and has done so for similar reasons. The application is not made in response to a local housing needs survey. The accommodation to provide meets no local need, neither for someone employed in any form of agricultural job, nor in any related field. The case officer sets out <clears throat> his reasons why the fallback position in this case is a material consideration. I agree with him. Arguably, this is the only consideration that could possibly save this application from refusal. Similarly, I agree with him that it's up to the members of the committee to use their own judgment in deciding what weight they should attach to the fallback position amongst their considerations. The committee did just that when it used its judgment in relation to the preceding application for the, for the demolition and redevelopment of these two barns and refused that application. The relevant question seems to be therefore, does the committee conclude that the fallback position would cause greater harm than the scheme proposed? Or put it another way, the committee would need to be satisfied that there were betterments in planning terms of the proposed scheme over the extent class Q scheme and preferably more than one if it were to be granted this, if this application were to be granted. Just what are those betterments in this case? As the local representative of the CPRE points out, there's little to choose in terms of appearance between the proposed house and the barn that it might replace. In his design and access statement, the applicant's agent points to only one single betterment, not in connection with the proposed dwelling itself, but in relation to the landscape of the site. He points, for instance, to the retention of all existing trees and hedges on the site. Is retention of the status quo the best betterment to which the agent can draw the committee's attention? Despite his recommendation, the doubts that the case officer has about this application are demonstrated first by his recommendation that there is a need to restrict the curtilage of the site so severely because of the danger of the further encroachment of residential paraphernalia into the open countryside. The question it is difficult to avoid is, if this application were granted, just how in practice would such a restricted curtilage be enforced in the longer term? Second, the case officer's doubts are demonstrated by his view that the applicant's permitted development rights should be removed because of the risk of further domestication of the site and undue harm being caused to the open countryside. Why would the case officer want either of these conditions other than because he recognises the sensitivity of this rural location. The applicant's agent makes something of the barn-like appearance of the proposed dwelling. This is intended to single, signal a virtue in the application. Why, should, why settle for a barn-like building, however, when there's an extent class Q permission for the conversion of a real barn? <laughs> if this application were to be granted, it would cause greater harm than the implementation of the class Q consent because the domesticating intrusion of the surrounding area into the open countryside, despite the intended condition, would in reality be physically greater than the alternative. If the CPRE observation on the appearance of the alternative barns is on offer is accurate, why would the committee not conclude that the less harmful extent class Q consent can and should be implemented? 30 seconds. On, the, on this basis, therefore, Mr. Chairman, 
I urge the committee to refuse the application. Thank you. I don't know how I managed to say the 30 seconds just before people stop, but there we are. Thank you very much, Councillor Harvey. Members, do we have any questions for our ward member, please? Yeah. Councillor Mills. Um, <clears throat> Councillor Harvey, you did say there were, there were no support from uh, local residents on this. Not that I'm aware of. But I can't see any objections on here from residents. So nobody's lodged an objection, have they? I looked through the report. Nobody's lodged an objection? That's been done through the parish council. But no residents? No so. resident that I know of. Okay, thank you. But can I can I add? I mean, you've answered the question. If Fine. it's related to the question, you can add. But if it's not related, then no. It, it, there's a contrast between this application and the previous application. That's all I'll say. Okay, anyone else have any other questions for Councillor Harvey? No, in that case, Councillor Harvey, thank you very much indeed. Okay, we have no speakers, no further speakers, I should say, on this item. So do we have any points of clarification for our officers? Councillor Parry, please. Excuse me, sorry. Can you just advise, um, if I'm right in thinking, it's fairly normal for permitted development rights to be removed for um, Class Q permissions. So on the previous, uh, on the extant uh, permission, would I be right in thinking that P PD rights have also been removed on that one? So there's, there's no differential in terms and it would be normal, therefore, for this to come forward with the PD rights removal. The ward member was suggesting that the PD rights were being removed because you were concerned about further sprawl of the um, proposed d dwelling in, in due course. Um, I haven't got um, the, the conditions for the class queue in front of me. Um, obviously, each application is assessed on its merits, but uh, kind of as you say, it's not unheard of for dwellings dwellings in close proximity to a country side for uh, officers to recommend uh, for PD rights to be removed. You can give me a moment to clarify. I think it could be a case we don't remove it because um, within the GPDO, there are certain things that you can't um, do under permitted development if you've had certain prior approvals so we could check the decision notice for the prior approvals just to check whether that's on there if you want us yeah. to that that's okay. Okay. i think that would be helpful i think what you've said is correct um while you're doing that we're going to ask for other people to ask their questions so councillor mills did you have one thank you. Uh, yeah thank you uh, do, um could you put up on the screen the um the proposed development because i think that that shows that's it, isn't it? So, at the moment, that's three. Did you, what is the height of it? It's six point six meters. Yeah, and the previous one was uh, the previous dwelling uh, that was refused at committee. Or, or do you mean the? Um, yeah. It was. I haven't got the exact measurement in front of me, but I'm pretty sure it was over eight meters. Um, I've got what might be helpful is so these are the elevations of the previous okay. uh, refused dwelling. Okay. Thank you. Could, could you bring up the image you had before? Yeah. So I can't. Yeah, go. On. It's worth it's worth pointing out the um, the green hatch yes. line. I know it's very difficult to see yeah, on this, yeah. uh, but that that I believe, and yeah. you clarify that yeah. is the um, is the refused yes. application. That's yeah. the outline. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Councillor Curtis, please. Yeah. Thanks, um, just a question about clarification over waste collection. I noticed the, I mean, highways have made no objection. There's no response from District Council Waste and Recycling. Is, do you know if there's sufficient room for a bin lorry to actually pull in off the road onto the site to collect bins? Uh, I'm, I haven't, I, I, I'm not wouldn't be able to get, give an answer to that myself. Um, as you say, highways, county council highways were consulted as part of the application and didn't sort of raise any objection or concern with regard to. But there's um, no no response. It's just that that road is really fast and you get some very dangerous driving along it, people doing ridiculous things. And if a bin lorry can't actually pull in to, to the, to the um, land itself, I think there could be a real Danger there, actually. Sorry, I'm speculating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
at the risk of going into debate, Sorry. one also has to bear in mind that there are already two dwellings approved there through the class queue, so there'd be more bins, double the amount. Um, but I'll leave you to do with that as you wish. Um, any other questions, uh, points of clarification? If not, we'll have an answer for Councillor Parry's question in momentarily, I think. Yes. Yeah, within the GPDO, um, the, obviously I can't go through every item, but, but generally um, permitted development rights that are afforded to, to householders in terms of extensions and alterations, mm -hmm. um, it's specifically cited that if um, permission to use the dwelling house as a dwelling house has been granted by virtue of class a number of classes but including class q of part three of the gpdo which this site has the benefit of they cannot undertake those works so ultimately the gpdo takes away their permitted development rights in the same way that planning application will be the condition lovely thank you very much indeed i don't think there are any more points of clarification so we will move into debate who would like to kick us off councillor rock thank you chairman um i find on in complete agreement with the ward member. Um, uh, I'm, obviously, we're, we're entering a very technical debate about the fallback position. But just because it's a bit smaller than the barn conversion would have been, I, I don't believe that's an improved uh, level of harm. Th this is an agricultural building in the countryside where agricultural buildings are found. Now we're proposing, uh, let's call it a normal house, a normal dwelling in the open countryside, which are all our policies resist. The argument is we can take a class Q building, which is highly restricted, is a highly restricted form of prior notice, which isn't actually a planning permi permission, as I understand it. It's, it's an exception of prior notice, which is very restricted. You can't do change windows, you can't change roof heights, you can't change walls, all that sort of thing. If we're now saying when we've got a class Q that's permitted, we can now turn it into a dwelling that is quite different, I think there's a real problem with that. And I, I think that represents harm to our district. And I think it represents harm in this particular case. So I would I would propose this, this uh, application is refused for the reason it's a different judgment, but I don't believe the fallback position uh, makes it less harmful. I think it makes it more harmful because it, it's a completely different dwelling to that that would be permitted under Class Q. And uh, uh, I would propose to refuse it, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Parry, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, they're always, they're, they always put one of these applications to sort of try our to test us, don't they? Um, the big issue I've got, I actually I actually don't like it, but my my biggest issue is that if committee were minded to refuse, it would go to appeal and we've got quite a lot of evidence of the strength and the weight that needs to be given to the fallback position. And I think that's my big concern because, yeah, I don't like it, but I but I, I can see this would get allowed at appeal because the evidence and the officer has clearly done his homework. Um, and therefore, it is not that I want to do it, but I, I'm going to have to go with the officer's recommendation because of what is the, the, the strength and the weight that we do have to give the fallback position. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Parry. Just so I can confirm, is that a proposal to grant? Yeah. Thank you very much. Councillor Mills, next, please. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, um, um, just um, the applicant seems to have gone quite a long way to uh, to com you know comply with uh, uh, the problems, the objections from the the last proposal. Um, I say the the officers seems to have gone a long way, and it's a very good report. So I, I will go with. Um, the Office of Recommendation on this, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Just to confirm, is that a formal seconding of Councillor oh, Parry's proposal? I'll second. Yes, thank, thank you. you very much. Anyone else? Councillor Eden was in first. I've changed my mind, as I do. <laughs> um, I think Councillor Rock makes a good point. Um, 
it concerns me that it becomes a very wide open door for anybody to turn a class queue potentially into something that's very different and for that reason i i think i'd support councillor rock's proposal as well should it go that way um just so i can confirm is that a formal seconding yes yes right i'm going to try and convince you the other way now no um, i have got councillor dixon uh, lined up to speak but if you don't mind i'm going to dive in before you just because i want to address that um i don't disagree with the sentiment of what both councillor rock and councillor Ed edden have said i think what you said councillor rock was we what we're saying is that you can get a class queue and then convert it we aren't saying that i think national policy and case law is saying that that's where the difference is i can't say that i like the idea that one could get a class queue and then apply to have it changed because it's not more harmful but the reality that is case law we can't change that certainly not sat around this table so we have to be mindful of that what councillor parry has said i think is absolutely spot on um, where we have to make a decision here is do we think what is put in front of us is more harmful than the fallback position which is the class queue the reality is it exists the full the fallback position so is it more harmful i don't think it is the reason i don't think it is is because it very much looks like um a uh, a barn like the existing barn but what councillor harvey said cpre their comment was there is little to choose between the current and the proposed that to me says there's no harm because there's little to choose i actually think this design is better than the uh the class q that's my personal view but that's a subjective one so hopefully i've convinced you the other way we'll find out in a minute um councillor dixon sorry for taking the line away from you over to you no problem chairman um i think one of the aspects that uh, also appears uh, <coughs> under various appeal decisions is the likelihood of the class q actually going ahead and i think the applicant uh, has indeed shown exactly what he wants he wants a family home he said his wife moved to the area etc job and what have you i don't think he wants two dwellings i don't think he wants to actually implement the park queue he wants a new dwelling in the open countryside and therefore i am not giving much reliance to the fact that there is a fallback position because i don't think he actually wants to implement it so i'm with councillors rock councillor Eden. <coughs> Okay, that's understood. Um, yep. I'd just remind you that the class queue is in fact extant, which means that material start has already been made. Whether they... Oh no, I just got that advice and now I'm being told that that's not the case. No, no. No, I said it. I said it's a class queue. I'll take that back. All right, we were, a slight miscommunication, possibly on my part, we don't know, but there we are. Um, okay, I'll take it back. Councillor Foreman. I'm just referring to the training that we did last week, um, the appeals training. And in that, uh, one of the things that we were told was that significant weight needs to be given to the fallback position when considering an application. So I am in agreement with Councillor Parry and Councillor Mills, and I will be supporting the application. Marvellous. Thank you very much indeed. I think we've pretty much covered everyone. Uh, the risk of going over the same old ground, I think we've probably moved to a vote. So we, the first proposal we got um, was from Councillor Parry to grant. That was seconded by Councillor Mills. We will take that one first. So could I please have a show of hands for those in favour of granting? Four. Those against? Three. And abstentions? Oh God, I thought I saw three then for a second. Two, <laughs> marvellous. Okay, so committee therefore resolves to grant application 2202164FUL, that is Treddington Hill Barnes in Treddington. Thank you very much. Let's move to our final item with two minutes to spare. You, you little faith. Um, okay, our next item is application reference 2201203, very that is land adjacent to the uh, chinneries in Friars Hardwick and our presenting officer is Lanika Agnew. Lanika will be with us in just a second. Lanika, as soon as you're ready and set to go, yeah. feel free to start. I Good evening, committee. So the application site is located in the park. Sorry, 
is located in the village of Priors Hardwick and is marked by a black circle on this map. This slide shows the application site outlined in red. The site is located to the north of the village along Church End and immediately off Welsh Road to the northeast. The application site lies adjacent to and shares its eastern and southern boundary with the Priors Hardwick Conservation Area. The application seeks planning permission for a section 73 application, which would vary the previously approved scheme granted on the 5th of October 2020. The applicant is seeking a variation condition, is seeking a variation of conditions two, approved plans, three, material schedule, four, sample panel of stonework, five, landscaping works, as during the construction of the dwelling, adjustments were made, including alterations in fenestration positioning, the inclusion of leaded dormers, ironstone mullion windows with steel casements, the lux windows black in colour, an amended design to the porch on the north elevation, removal of roof lights to the front and side elevations, the construction of a brick and stone wall and an amended landscaping scheme. Here we can see the approved western gable elevation of the dwelling which included a large area of glazing. However, the glazing served a void area, so views directly out of the glazing would have been restricted. As now proposed, the area of glazing in the western gable has been significantly reduced. It now comprises a small window at first floor level and a further window at the top of the gable end. Internally, the void has been removed at first floor and the window will serve a dressing room. This has been set out within the officer's report. Here we have a floor plan comparison to highlight the internal changes. The window serves the dressing room associated with the master bedroom. The window would look towards the rear garden associated with the chinneries. This is a photograph of the constructed western facade of the dwelling. And this is a photograph of the eastern elevation of the neighbouring dwelling of the chinneries. This window serves the bedroom. With regard to landscaping, the most significant change which is proposed is the revised landscaping plan, is the introduction of a wall to the eastern, southern and western boundaries of the site. Native hedging was approved under the previous application and whilst this is still proposed, it would be located within the site behind the wall which has been erected. As we can see from the following site photographs, the wall is constructed of brick with stone wing walls to the front eastern elevation. The buildings in Prize Hardwick are predominantly constructed in Horton stone and red brick. This is a view of the wall and a view of the southern view from the top of Church End. Whilst hedges are the predominant boundary treatment where visible from the public realm within the settlement, there are also other examples of hard boundary treatments. The most notable being Parks House, which is sited to the immediate east of the application site and is within the Prize Hardwick Conservation Area. Parks House has a brick and stone wall located at vehicular entrance point, which is visible when approaching the <coughs> village in a southerly direction from the north. And this is directly opposite the application site. As set out within the officer's report, the variation of conditions 2, 3, 4 and 5 would not result in a material or additional harm to the amenity of neighbouring properties, would not adversely impact the overall visual amenity of the development and continue to preserve the setting of the Prize Hardwick Conservation Area. It's therefore officer's recommendation for the application to be granted subject to the following conditions found within the report. Thank you. Lanika, thank you very much indeed. Um, and let us call on our first speaker on this item, who is Mr Stuart Hyde from Prior's Hardwick Parish Meeting. Good evening, Mr Hyde. Thank you very much for your patience. It's been a long evening for all of us. I think you've got a good idea of, uh, of how this is going to work now, so you'll have three minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning whenever you're ready. Uh, that's fine. Okay. I'm ready. Uh, so I have a short prepared statement to make. Uh, say I'm Stuart Hyde, uh, Chair of Prize Hardwick Parish Meeting. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. Uh, some others will be speaking. They will be presenting uh, some pictures uh, to support their statements, but not wishing to steal their thunder. Mine will be narrative only. Uh, I will be speaking specifically about overlooking and boundary issues that arise from the variation plan being considered here now. Uh, before I talk about those, firstly, uh, some quick background context uh, for the village. So, Prize Hardwick is a small, idyllic village, beautiful even, set in the open countryside uh, near to the town of uh, Sarah. 
excuse me, a bit nervous. Um, it was the first time. It has within its heart a conservation area and listed ancient monument site. The plot in question sits on the edge of the conservation area and has approved permission for a dwelling. This application, it was supported by the village at the parish meeting held in August 2020. The resulting house is impressive, but it does contain a number of differences from the approved plan of which there are real concerns over two, the overlooking and boundary issues. The first issue is, as noted by the, uh, the planning officer, is the window serving the dressing room in the western gable. This was built of clear glass and directly overlooks the immediate neighbouring property, the chinneries. The planning officer is recommending that the window is, is obscure glazed. I fully support this. Even more so if the replacement glazing installation is of permanent glazed nature and not a temporary one such as uh, removable fill. The second issue is the boundary wall that is adjacent to the road church end. The original approved application included a landscaping plan of natural native planning along the road boundary is consistent with treatments throughout the village and the conservation area. The village in its support supported this. The belt finished though and included in the variation is a high brick wall along the majority of the road boundary with the remainder being the house on the entrance gates for the driveway. Although the planning officer notes that there is a similar brick wall as shown for the picture on the adjacent property across the road, it is materially smaller, perhaps tiny even in comparison, and that I'm aware of, there is no such precedent elsewhere in the village of this scale or this proximity to the road. It so, is. Oh, sorry, I was going to say 30 seconds. Okay, neither. It is and would be an imposing construction if approved, and as such, this is not supported. It would materially change the character and look of the village and conservation area to which the plot abounds. And in the words of the planning officer, it is regrettable. Thank you. Uh, nothing else to add to that. We appreciate your time. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Sorry for cutting across. I thought I got you at a pause, but I was uh, not. Yeah, you kind of did. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was babbling. Members, do we have any questions for our parish meeting representative? No. In that case, Mr Hyde, thank you very much for your time and patience. And I'm sorry it's too hot. <laughs> <laughs> we will... We will call our next speaker who of the evening, who is Mr. Paul Hobday. OK, Mr. Hobday, I think you again, you've got the drill, haven't you? You'll have three minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning when you're ready and comfortable. The floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Paul Hobday. I live at Chinneries. I'm the nearest neighbour to the planning variation application. I've objected to the application 2201203 Vary for the following planning reasons. The requested substitution of drawings causes overlooking and loss of privacy to the entire rear garden of the neighbouring house chinneries from the window in the western gable of the newly built house. This window above my garden can be seen in one of the photographs. Perhaps you can show the other one that I sent in. That's it, thank you. Uh, the planning approval um, in 2020, which was approved, uh, specifies drawings which avoid overlooking and loss of privacy to all the rear garden of chinneries. This is achieved because the extensively glazed western um, gable should have continuous internal wall screening all the, the glazing at first full level. Perhaps you can see the other picture I sent in, please. Thank you. Not a great scale, but it's there. Um, there should be no first floor to stand on between the internal wall and the glazing. It's labelled as a void. These features can be seen on the approved plans, which are visible to you now. The 2020 approved planning application confirms multiple times the desire to avoid overlooking and loss of privacy. For example, the design and access statement states it is carefully designed not to overlook the neighbours. It also states occupants of new and neighbouring buildings would be protected from loss of privacy. Pre-application planning advice from Louise Casey of Stratford District Council expressed clear concerns about the position and orientation of the house before the 2020 application. I was relieved to see the architect of the 2020 plans had done his best to ensure privacy. Because of these assurances, I supported the 2020 planning application and I'm disappointed to find significant changes have occurred. 
This overlooking window frame first appeared in November 2021. In discussion at the time, I was told frosted glass would be fitted. A few days later, clear glass was fitted. In October 22, 11 months later, a plastic frosted film was applied just prior to this meeting. The current variation application does not specify obscure glazing. If approved, this planning application would allow the applicant to revert to clear glazing. 30 seconds. Could I ask please that the planning department considers applying a planning condition that any first floor windows in the Western Gable must permanently be obscure glazed. Your assistance is much appreciated. Um, Paul and Rosemary Hobley. Thank, Thank you. you. Very, Thank you very much indeed. Just bear with me for while we see if we've got any questions. Anyone got any questions for Mr Hobday? Don't think so. In that case, Mr. Hobby, thank you very much for your time, Many thanks. and of course your patience. Okay, uh, our final speaker of the evening is Mr. Or Mr. Councillor Rock. Sorry, I've been demoted. Tripping over my own tongue tonight. Uh, Councillor Northern Rock. <laughs> Councillor Rock, um, you'll have five minutes. I'll give you. 30. I, I didn't know I hadn't been heard of, but anyway. <laughs> you've got. I'll give you. Sorry, you've got five minutes. I'll give you thirty seconds. Morning, uh, when I, you're I'll, ready. I'll see the officer's got my slides ready already, so thank you very much. It's over to you. Okay. Uh, during the build of this house, diversions from the approved <coughs> plans were made. If those changes had been applied for in advance, all but two would have been approved without controversy. The added window overlooking the private spaces of the neighbouring property can be readily dealt with by the use of the council standard condition for obscuration, as the officers are recommending and which I support. And we've got slide one there. The second concern is the boundary treatment. As acknowledged in the original application, Prize Hardwick is an exceptionally picturesque, almost a picture postcard village. I will refer to, to page 71, the last paragraph, and the last two paragraphs of page 72 of the report. I note that the officer considers the scheme to be regrettable by replacing the hedge with walls. This is a straightforward case whether we want to allow these retrospective changes which forms the boundary of the conservation area. Could I have slide two, please? The design and access statement of the approved application included these pictures showing the original hedges compared with other features in the conservation area, making the case for development in this setting. The approved design illustrated a carefully thought out hedge with native species planting following the line of the road. Could I have slide three, please? What has been built, however, are three sections of high walls, part brick, part stone, fronting onto the highway with a protruding corner. This construction does not accord with RSPD D4, which requires front walls and fences adjacent to roads to be limited to 1.2 metres, even if they were not forming the boundary to a conservation area. It also does not comply with SPD Part M for land landscaping and trees. Could I have slide four, please? The top plan is the, is the one that was approved, including the hedge, and the lower one, the scheme before you now. The plot is prominent at a key entrance to the village. The long wall that has been built to the south terminates in a sharp corner, protruding further into the verge than the 45 degree chamfered off hedge line than that, that originally proposed in the top picture. Could I have slide five, please? There was a tree and root protection plan in the original application, which appears to have been breached. So there is some question that the growth which partially protects the view of the brick wall from the village will not be so softened in the future. Could I have slide six, please? This is a fine house and commands the entrance to the village from Southend, partly reflecting the design of Park's house opposite, built, I believe, by the same family. But these 51 metres of walls in their setting is quite unlike any other feature in the conservation area where all the other boundaries are hedges or in a few cases low walls, mostly stone. The only wall that approaches it in character is the one at Park's house opposite. But this is a shorter wall, eight metres long, fronted by planting set well back and parallel to the road. The committee needs to consider if this walling is appropriate to the conservation area vernacular, regardless of whether it is retrospective or had been submitted in advance. The sole consideration should be its accordance with the guidance for conservation areas, SPDs and the core strategy. Could you flip back to side three, please? 
consistency is an issue. Uh, in June this year, for an application in the Prize Marston Conservation Area, the applicants were advised against a wall of similar height to this one and that a hedge would be more acceptable. Subsequently, that high was withdrawn from the application and a low wall substituted and then approved. The key difference seems to be they asked first. Elsewhere, planning inspectors have taken the view that unduly dominant boundary features constitute harm where they are incongruous with and detract from the qualities of the conservation areas. I therefore suggest that the wall, the wall harms the character and appearance of the conservation area is contrary to the MPPF and our policies CS8, CS9 and CS12, also SPD Part D and Part M. Also, rather than make the positive contribution as desired by paragraph 131 of the framework, the development harms local character. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much. I was going to give you a 30 second warning, but I put my faith in you that you were coming to an end and you did indeed. Uh, that was a relief, I must say. Yeah, not because you came to the end, but anyway. Um, members, do we have any questions for our ward member? Councillor Dixon, please. Uh, Councillor Rock, uh, local knowledge. Um, Park House opposite. Obviously, uh, that wall has some uh, vegetation, uh, as it were, helping to hide it. Could a similar situation be provided at this one, or is that highway land which can't be, as it were, impeded? Uh, in, in fact, I anticipated your question because oh. I went and bought the land registry plan, and uh, the wall forms the boundary of the of the site according to the land registry. I believe I've supplied it to the officer if you wanted to see it. Uh, the picture of the wall, I think the officer's got this in one of my earlier slides, if it's, uh, it's the middle one on the right in one of those, if you wanted to see it, because that does have some planting in it, as you quite rightly point out. Uh, that one, yeah. Yeah. that's nicely hidden. <clears throat> Councillor Parry, please. Thank you, Councillor Rock. Um, it's unfortunate that the applicant isn't here this evening, otherwise I would have liked to have asked them the question. But if I may ask you, um, presumably you've had some conversations with the applicant, and if so, did you, did you ask them why they opted to go for the wall rather than the, the plan vegetation hedging, which is, on my knowledge, of this lovely village um, more more typical? I, I've not had any interaction with the applicant. Okay. They've not approached me and obviously they have not approached them. Okay, do we have any other questions or points of clarification? Uh, to, sorry, questions for our war member? Crikey. No? In that case, Councillor Rock, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Um, points of clarification, do we have any of those? Councillor Edmund. Sorry, just to help my understanding while we we're flicking around lots of <coughs> photos. Um, there was one photograph where the wall clearly changes colour of brick. Um, where it changes, is that where the hedge would have started or would it have gone all the way up to the, the gable end of the, the house? Um, so it would have gone right up to the gable end of the house. It would demarcate right. the whole of the... the that, that's dwelling. kind of how I read the plans. Yeah. But yeah, it just looks like... Any other points of clarification? Councillor Harvey, please. The the window, that uh, the offending window that uh, overlooks, is it within our power this evening to require that to be removed rather than just um, glazed? That's one question. No, it's on the plans. Um, it's on the plans. Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, <clears throat> Secondly, is it open to us to require the wall to be demolished? Again, it's 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 within the plans and it's also included within the description of development. So, no, you can't make a, a split decision saying that you approve certain elements, but you, you know, in effect, you could be refusing that part. That's, so we that's are the basket of variations or we don't? Yes. On, if I if I may, on that um, point, and I think uh, Councillor Dixon was going along the same lines, um, would it be uh, appropriate or suitable for us to put a condition on to reinstate the hedge in front of that wall? 
I, I, I note that, that the reason I asked as a separate condition from the landscaping is I note that the um, condition two is in accordance with landscaping scheme and replacement planting, which I assume means the old one. We can't adjust that because it's part of a previous application or the uh, part of the other approved. Adding a condition in to ensure that a hedge is in front of that yeah. will go a long way to making me more comfortable. I understand that the um, the red line surrounding the site it, it, but directly abuts the wall so in effect you wouldn't be able to put a condition on requiring them to do works that are outside of their land it wouldn't be it wouldn't meet the tests particularly we we don't know whether they own it and we don't know whether it's council owned my understanding of planning law is that i could in theory put an application on council Pester's land he frequently does <laughs> you, what you're saying, what you, what you're saying is, if if that was granted, I wouldn't be able to do it unless he gave me permission. So we could put the condition on, but it would have to get permission for the land. Is that correct, or is that am I completely out of the? No, you're. It's two separate things. When you're applying a condition, it has there has to be a a reasonable prospect of um, the condition being able to be implemented. <coughs> don't have any evidence that that land is within their ownership within Understood. a blue line or the, the red line of the plan we can't give that guarantee that got it can be so it wouldn't it wouldn't meet the tests got you thank you very much councillor parry um i'm just thinking if if the committee were minded to grant on the obscure glazing can we um insist that that is a com the, it, it's it's glass obscurity it's not film that's put on the back because in my view if it's if it's going if it's got to be obscure glazing it's got to be it's got to be a permanent <coughs> situation not a yeah. not a obscure piece of film yeah. Yeah. that could be removed mm -hmm. i believe we can councillor parry yeah the 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 standard condition tends to reflect the a similar approach as in permitted development but if councillors are worried about the permanency of it obviously it is the condition is for the lifetime of the de development and also we could include that it's it's not openable if that is something that would help For what it's worth, and I don't want to strain the debate yet, but it's not uncommon to have the film there. And as as we've heard from Emily, the, the condition is in perpetuity. So if that were to be peeled off or taken away, it has to go back on again or then breach. And we would ensure that, well, I say we, it would be an enforcement case. And I'm, I have no doubt it would get taken to enforcement properly. Um, but I do understand your point. Councillor Mills, someone else did put a finger yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, could you put the photograph up of the offending window? Can you put it up for me, please? That is it. Is it? Is it a? Is it a bedroom or is it a bathroom? Dressing room. Dressing room. Yeah. Funny enough, no. Got two. <laughs> yeah. Right. So okay. So yeah. Okay. Councillor Curtis, I think you signalled as well. Have you got one? Yeah, no, it was uh, on the point of it being a non-opening glazed window, right. which has already been covered. Thank you. Okay. In that case, if there are no, Councillor Harvey, let's move into debate. Councillor Harvey, would you like to kick off? Yes, I don't know if you before, but I visited the site. I drove around the village, um, and it struck me that it's accurate to say that the village is built, built of both Horton stone and brick. That is true, but it is very predominantly Horton stone um, rather than brick. I didn't, I may have missed them, but I didn't see any other brick walls, uh, boundary walls. I saw uh, houses where there were a mixture of brick and Horton stone. Um, so that tells me that this, uh, my interpretation of what I saw was, this is a very prominent brick wall uh, on the Eastern approach to, to the village. And it is very, very noticeable. That's one thing. The second thing is I looked up um, Google Earth, I looked the site up, and you can only see it from the road junction. But what that photograph or that, what that picture shows you is the, the site before the work began, and it shows the hedge. And I have to say, the contrast between what was there 
And what <coughs> is there now is, is very stark. And I'm very sympathetic to Councillor Rock's point of view that what is there now is it is red brick, there is red brick in, in, in the village. But to my eyes and my appreciation, it is disproportionately intrusive and harmful in the context of the village as a whole. Can I just check whether you are you, you are proposing refusal for that reason? I have a difficulty because I, uh, on the grounds that the window is obscured, I can understand the reasonableness of the other other variations. But so I'm I'm stuck. I'm I I would much prefer that what was approved as far as the boundary, i.e., the retention of the hedge, was was reinstated and the wall was pulled down. But I, I recognise I've either got to vote for one or the or the whole basket. So I'm going to assume from what you've just said that you're not proposing it at this stage. Not at this stage. In that case, I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> for the same reasons you've put. Um, I've got no problem with the obscure glazed window. I, I don't like it. It's, I think that's ugly, but that's my personal subjective view. Um, the wall, I, 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 can't, I can't see a way of getting around it. Um, whilst I accept that uh, within the village there are examples of red brick and Horton stone combined and indeed we've seen a picture of that we've also seen a picture of that with lots of flowers and planting and what have you in front of it, it makes it very pretty I thought that was lovely at that point I was thinking yeah this we could we could work our way around this we have heard that that boundary the red line boundary sits right on the edge of that wall which means anything that's planted on the other side we have been told shouldn't be there it's not their land shouldn't be doing it so it can't be hidden and on the basis that it can't be hidden, I think it caused material harm to the uh, street scene, to the village, to that area. I'm proposing that we refuse on that basis. Councillor Parry, please. You jumped ahead of me, Councillor Richards. Um, I actually drive through Pryor's Hardwick two or three times a week. It's en route to see my grandchildren. Um, and it is one of the most picturesque villages um, just south of Southam, a lot of Horton Stone, and I cannot possibly, um, I just can't support this application because of the hard landscaping of that wall. I could have lived with the with the window, um, but it is it is totally out of character of the village, which is very quaint, very. It, the Cotswold, um, it's not Cotswold, it's Horton Arn Stone, um, which is very familiar to this part of Warwickshire and also South Northamptonshire. Um, and therefore, I'm happy to second your um, proposal to refuse planning application. Thank you very much. Councillor Mills, next, please. Yeah, I, I did take a look at the application. We went through the flood there. Yeah, that, that wall, I mean, it's just... Uh, stands out like a sore thumb and I have to agree with uh, Councillor uh, Deborah Harvey and, and Anne Perry and yourself Mr Chairman. Um, yeah, I think we'd have to refuse it. Thank you. Councillor Dixon next please. Essentially, if I think the original application had indicated a wall like that, we wouldn't have granted permission in the first place. Um, but I think by refusing this variation now, which is where I would be voting, uh, is a situation whereby the applicant can either take down the wall and reset a hedge, alternatively see if there is any way they can themselves acquire a strip of land in front of that wall, whereby they can actually hide that with some vegetation. Thank you. Okay. Um, just mindful of the fact that we, that that is not an indication that we might grant something in the future. Clearly, we will take whatever is presented to us first but i understand your sentiment um short of asking people to repeat the same thing over and over again we have a proposal to refuse for good re for good reasons <laughs> i should for reasons i should say i would say they're good they were mine um and it's been seconded um uh, let's have a vote on that and then obviously we can move on from there so yes um i'm just being reminded that we should uh, that wording will be delegated to the officers for that reason for refusal um, so, got to have a show of hands for those in favour of refusing. I could I please have a show of hands for those in favour of refusing uh, application 22012023, Barry. 
that appears to be unanimous. So the committee therefore has resolved to refuse application 2201203, very uh, land adjacent to the Chinneries in Price Hardwick for the reasons given. Um, we do have no urgent business, you'll be pleased to know. So members, thank you very much for your time and contribution. Officers, thank you very much for yours as well, and of course the public too. And of course, our new sound man. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks.